boom, and we're live. Yes. Russell, why is it then when people start getting like super spiritual, they start dressing like you? You dress like a guru. We circulate a memo. <laughs> so it's now time to stop wearing socks, stop shaving, <laughs> and make eye contact for a bit too long. Oh, it uncomfortable just... eye contact. <laughs> Give a bit starey. How long are you going to go with the beard? I mean, that's that's like, you're you're full on like, you're a yogi now. I mean, it's gone beyond Jesus and into yeah. Moses and lesser prophets, or, Old Testament. Or a Navy SEAL. You're in that range, too. Like, yeah. you could be some wild man. That's that's a mistake that wouldn't... <laughs> <laughs> that, like, if there was an assault course in front of us, that, that the potential for me being a Navy SEAL would start to break down. I once went on a an assault course with some U.S. Marines in that place near San Diego. I can't remember the name of that base. And climbing up that rope using mm. your leg muscles, it was not good value. Didn't enjoy it? I like the camaraderie. And yeah. I really like... I. As I've written about and talk about quite a lot, when I'm around very in very male environments, I kind of really like it. I really get off in it, but I have to watch myself not getting too excitable. It's even in this environment, as a matter of fact, I have to keep myself a little bit chilled out. And Why? Like, what do you mean? What does it do to you? Well, I guess what it is, is my early life, I grew up mostly around my mum and I don't have brothers and sisters and stuff like that. So my male role modelling occurred later in life. And I think it probably mm. relates to this spiritual thing. I think it meant that I was, I'm very open to sort of spiritual experience, meditative experience. So I didn't have mm. a lot of grounding physical experiences or bodily experiences really till adolescence and, till se and sexuality. That's the first time I really sort of got into the body. Didn't do sport as a kid. Didn't have like men going, right, this is what we do. This is how we shave. This is how you treat mm. people. This is, you know, I didn't really sort of get that kind of education. So now still, if I'm around like soldiers, UFC fighters, I go, you know, you know, I do BJJ yeah. primarily as a result of these Confront well, let's not call them confrontations. <laughs> <laughs> conversations. <laughs> conversations. That's a much yeah. nicer term. So, like, I there's a bit of me that's the guy get excited about the analysis of it. It's not homoerotic because that doesn't happen to be the way that I roll out. You just enjoy a little too much. There's something about it. Yeah, you get fired <laughs> up, and it maybe what, what's bad about it? What's what's bad about getting fired up? Nothing for me, except like, you know, look, my, as you know, my model for life is a sort of a 12 step model about watching my impulses. Yes. My impulses have got me in a lot of trouble. My impulses to take drugs, my impulses to sleep around, my, like my impulses to even eat food. I've got a sort of a tendency to get obsessive. But, you know, you would probably argue that if you direct that, that energy correctly, it can be kind of positive. I, I suppose. think it can, but I agree with you that it can get out of control. And I have similar impulses. I have similar problems. And yeah. I've, I've just used discipline and hard work, especially working out, to try to mitigate it. Well, that's what I pick up from you is that your early encounters with martial arts have meant that you've understood from a young age, it seems to me, physical discipline and i think that's a very important thing and i'm only learning that mm. like now because i've had a like you know drugs then fame then and, and chaos and i've only just emerged from like the sort of the fog of that madness i love how you've emerged though because it's very unique you've you you've uniquely emerged authentically like you this is who you really are like you're not putting on an act you have found yourself which is like what everybody wants to do they want to find themselves i mean it never feels like a completed task Right, it never. Everyone's a work in progress forever. That's but, right. But you are you. Like you are very comfortably you, and you've found what makes you you. That's a lovely compliment to get from you, Joe. I appreciate that because what I think about is like you're a very different type of person to me. There's things that in this world, in these polemical times, you and I would be supposed to. I, I would say take adversarial stances on i'm vegan now mm -hmm. you love hunting but my personal philosophy is my morality and my spirituality is for me it's not something i go around inflicting on other people and telling them how they should behave i, yes. rec I know enough now to know people are different people have different experiences and i don't let those things get in the way of how i evaluate other people we should all be more like that i really i really believe that I mean, there's so many people that I disagree with that I have fine conversations with. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I don't think that impulse to, to have antagonistic engagements with people that you disagree with is correct. How else are we going to consolidate? Yes. If, if like it's just like, I'm only going to deal with people that see the world roughly how I do. How are we going to um, yeah. form new tribes, new alliances, new relationships, new systems at a time when evidently, it feels to me at least, Joe, like things are breaking down. Yeah. There's a lot of 
bitterness, acerbity and confrontation and people don't want to talk to each other. I mean, I don't know how real that is of actual people. I'm talking, I suppose, about how the media landscape seems to present information. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true when you're, you know, when I'm around people, I don't sense, oh, wow, these guys are really tied up in Brexit or Trump or whatever. It doesn't seem that relevant to ordinary people. It seems to me that people are still operating on a in a personal how are you today are you yeah. okay you know people are willing to get on like that i mean how, how are we supposed to take these ideas on board they're sort of almost too vast for us these right. geopolitical ideas that we're asked to identify with right and then your everyday life it hardly ever affects you or affects you very little in comparison to things that you ignore because you're concentrating on brexit or you're concentrating on trump or you're concentrating on whatever it is yeah the that's wall right. build that wall whatever it is yeah you, i start to wonder you know, who is it that's involved in this stuff? I start to, what it's, where I'm at now is, ca are we even capable of belonging to groups, units, tribes of 300 million people or 60 million people with so many diverse ideas? Is this a time to look at federalism differently, to start breaking down, well, you know, the I exist within this tribe of people, but mm -hmm. I collaborate with all these other people. I don't know how municipal action gets done. I don't know how you run an army and build roads if people are starting to operate in smaller units. But I am thinking that, we need to have a, a real sense of community and connection and we've got to let go of looking for ways to object to and judge other people as some sort of primary for way of forming our own identity. No, I, I completely agree. And I think we're probably moving towards some sort of understanding that a lot of these boundaries and these clans of you know states and countries... They were all established without our consent before we were born, and we're we're just we're a part of a system that we just were we didn't agree to it. We just all of a sudden found ourselves in it, and we're trying to make it fit us. Yeah, that's right. You know? And th there's aspects of it that <coughs> are appealing. You know, like sort of during a World Cup, I really sure. feel English and feel yeah. like, you know like I feel a genuine sense of it's connection fine. and investment. But if I'm being asked to live according a rules that don't affect me that affect except for you know that affect me financially and don't speak to who i am as an individual then i'm like well what is this this, this isn't yeah. for my benefit yeah yeah when the the inclination to form teams and to root for your team and to root against other teams it's so uh, it's so deep-seated in us it's uh, and it can ca cause so many unnecessary conflicts for no reason it's just it's it's so it's so escapable too. It's it's some it's so if you can objectively analyze the way human beings behave and interact with each other and go, well, why do we do this? Let's just stop doing that. Mm. Let's just t if we disagree on things, how much are these disagreements actually affecting me on a daily basis? Not that much. Can we just communicate? Can't someone say what they think and I say what I think and we just d decide like what makes sense and what doesn't make sense based on our own interpretations? Isn't that possible? It seems like it's that's the direction we've got heading. I, I did, a, as I know you have done, a podcast with Candice Owens who like on the subject of you know, individual, like when she says stuff like uh, people <laughs> should get over slavery or it's as if it didn't happen. I don't agree with that. I feel like that has a massive social impact that, it's, that those sure. statistics are not a coincidence. The number of people of certain ethnicities in prisons and in poverty or whatever. Sure. For me, that's not just a coincidence. But like, so I <coughs> couldn't agree with her more profoundly on according to social criteria, some very, very important issues. But on an interpersonal level, I thought she was absolutely delightful. Yeah. Like sort of funny and sweet, and she's very young. If you really stop oh, and think about that it, what's going she's on. only twenty-eight, which is amazing. Is right? That, is, that, is that correct? <coughs> she's so much smarter than I was when I was twenty-eight. She's certainly a lot more confident than yeah, I was. She's when prettier I was too. 29. Twenty-eight or twenty-nine? Indeed. Same thing. So when I was twenty-nine, I was a fucking moron. Okay, and no one would ever listen to my opinions on anything in on on the world stage. Yeah, and people are <laughs> listening to her. I mean, she's she's testifying in front of Congress. I mean, she's very, so I cut her a lot of slack with some of the things that she's made like missteps on. And I think sometimes when people say those things, like people should get over slavery, it's like it's almost like you're saying things that you think other people want to hear more than you're saying things that are really rational. So whether or not we should get over slavery, sure, slavery was over more than 100 years ago, but the repercussions of slavery, the echoes of slavery still exist. And they exist in all these different southern states and cities and all these different neighborhoods that had been a part of systemic racism where they had literally forced black people to live in certain areas. 
and didn't even allow them to buy homes outside of those areas. They made laws. And those laws are in place in places like Baltimore. And, you know, I had this guy, Michael Wood, on, who was a uh, police officer in the city of Baltimore. And one of the more profound things that he said was that they found papers that were documenting crimes from the 1970s in Baltimore. And they were in the same area, the same crimes that he was facing in the 2000s when he was a police officer. So he Mm. was looking at this going, what in the fuck? Like, this is, am I just a part of something that's never going to be fixed and never going to be changed? And, you know, as he learned more about the city and the city's laws and how these these systems were set up to keep people in certain places and how the crime and the violence and the drugs is all just in this one concentrated area and it's always been there and no one does anything to change it. You, You realize like, wow, this is a... This is a crazy echo of a horrible past, and that's what it is. I had a couple of conversations that made me recognize how powerful systems and institutions are (coughs) and their ability to maintain themselves, regardless of any individuals. It seems like what happened there with the man you were chatting to is that he's an individual, woke up, and went, oh my God, hold on a second, I'm in some sort of weird (laughs) grid. And like I spoke to this fella called Ken Ross, who worked for the British Diplomatic Service at the time of 9-11 and was privy to confidential information about how that was handled on a military and geopolitical level. And he said, like, he's come away from that thinking, well, these institutions function and in a totally corrupt way to pursue their own objectives. Disingenuity and dishonesty is just part of the system. And it was him that made me think about anarchism in a different way, saying that people, the assumption that people, if they were not tightly governed with big government and huge control, would go around murdering each other and raping each other, simply not true. That's one of the means by which the state continues to justify its existence. People will behave better the closer they are to self-governing community mm. self-governing community and this is like and I was interested in that because he's talking from this is what I saw on the inside uh, this is how I saw it was running like your cop friend there and like uh, another person I spoke to that had been inside a system and then woken up uh, within it who was that oh yeah Yanis Varoufakis he was when Greece had that mad revolution he was like one of the leaders of a party Syriza and for a minute it was like Syriza said we ain't paying back all those debts you screwed us financially you screwed Greece so he was there at the EU meetings telling like the German chancellery we're not pay- re- Greece ain't going to repay those debts and he just said that the way that the system reasserted itself was m- magnificent to watch in a way and he said none of those individuals have any power except the power that that role gives them if if you are the German finance minister, you've got the power that a German finance minister has. You can't step outside it and start going, right, listen, why don't we do this and why don't we do that? The system itself resp- is beyond individual decisions. You know, it's, it's a mm. self-sustaining system. It won't come up with ideas or support ideas that threaten it. And that's why I continually keep hearing, and I'm sure you're having similar conversations, that if you are really interested in changing the world, you have to participate in systems that are outside of it. Set up new ideas. Don't worry about trying to smash this one down with a hammer it will atrophy on its own as it becomes less and less relevant i think also change yourself and when you change yourself becomes evident to the people around you and if your change is beneficial and attractive (coughs) people they gravitate towards that idea that you you can improve yourself and you can you change your perspective on things well that is the one area of your life where you've got some authority and control Mm -hmm. and that's yeah that is what i'm about is like the well i can stop myself being like a a, a watching pornography i can stop myself using drugs if i want to like you know with some support and that's what that this book here mentors which i talk about you in only for a paragraph you know what i mean it's not too it's not like a like literary fellatio it's a a small (laughs) nod of your uh like of your influence and impact (coughs) I talk about how we have latent latent qualities within us that are sometimes hard to realize on on without support but if you find a mentor in an area where you're looking to improve they can kind of energize awaken energies within you that on your own you wouldn't be able to use i had a really recent experience of it where i was sort of like freaking out about something i spoke to like a a mentor of mine and like the way that he sort of spoke to me was like sort of aggressive like a sort of an aggressive that's not going to happen you are not afraid and like it sort of it woke up the part of me that Mm. feels that way that has that kind of i would say sort of uh male 
certainty a kind of grounded energy he was able to sort of like direct it at me and like in that moment in myself or bewildered i wasn't able to do it you know mm. i needed to resource it externally in a moment hmm. so this is how i sort of feel like your individual journey i'm interested in how because i'm guessing with your background in martial arts and stuff mentorship seems pretty much stitched into that you must continually be looking at someone learning from someone yeah. trying to equal them or whatever it is yeah, the good part about that is you get good at learning things and you get good at listening. You know, uh, as a martial arts student, you you don't just listen; you listen very intently. You bow, you say "sir." You know, I mean, there's uh, there's so much discipline involved in the 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 act of learning. Yeah, and so much reverence and respect for people who know more than you and appreciation. So uh, that that helped me with pretty much everything I ever wanted to learn. I just would listen very intently. I don't think ah maybe I could figure it out better. I will, I'm very good at listening to people that are good at things. That's interesting. Did you first get into uh, like you know I've picked up stuff over the various shows of yours that I've listened to, but would you say that your inaugural interest in martial arts came from kind of domestic distress and stuff yeah. you having a difficult home life and not a good relationship with your stepdad am i right in saying it was that but it was it was also move, moving more than anything i mean my stepdad was a nice guy um but it was stepdad's it's always a weird situation you know no but, one likes the dynamic of someone having sex with their mother. I remember <laughs> <laughs> having the similar feelings about my own stepdad. What He's are they a doing great guy, in there? though. I don't want to like no, of course. paint him in a bad way. No. It's just what was really hard was moving a lot and running into bullies. That was way harder than anything else. So there was a time in your life where you felt very, uh, presumably, vulnerable yes. and not grounded. Didn't have any friends, constantly moving to new neighborhoods, meeting new people. And, uh, you know, and when you're a young boy, you're a teenage boy, teenage boys are fucking dangerous. Yeah, man. they're the worst. They're the worst. If you they're see a group of them now, I'm talking about my country, 13, 14 years old, I'll, I'll cross the street. Yeah. They're lawless. Yeah. Well, yeah, young boys are just, they're always looking to impress each other. And they, they, they have these, if you want to find real toxic masculinity, it exists in teenage boys. You yeah, know, it's, and it's, it's mostly exaggerated form. in men. <clears throat> the way it's described is mostly exaggerated in terms of the way the media talks about it, but it, in its purest form, and teenage boys, they get together and they start lighting frogs on fire and doing shit. They do things because they want to like one up each other and they feed off of each other. Like what one boy would do is so different than what five boys would do. What five boys would do could be horrific, but what yeah. one boy would do on his own is very rarely there. Because what you know, you have to think about yourself and think about is this right and. You objectively an analyze the way you're behaving and like, um, yeah, people wouldn't be proud of me if I did it this way. Mm. But when you're with five other boys and you're, you're all rambunctious and filled with testosterone and piss and vinegar, you wind up doing crazy things. This is, I, you know, when I hear something like that, it's difficult <clears throat> not to think that it's, of course, relative. Relative to us, the behavior of adolescent males is reckless and crazy it's not impossible to conceive of an intelligence that would look at the behavior of adult human beings and think oh my god what yeah. are what's governing these people what principles are they using right you know, like what's the end goal too like what are you trying to accomplish with your life with your existence with your time i think if there's a real concern about ai I think the real concern is AI is going to rationally analyze our behavior and our uh, reliance on emotions and all these human reward systems that we have built in, the way it's affecting our society and the way it's affecting how we govern ourselves and how we behave amongst ourselves. And it's going to think we're unfixable. It's going to look at it like, well, this is, this is, they have too much monkey in them. They have so much m monkey instincts and monkey DNA, but now they live in this rational, modern world of, you know, 5G internet on your phone and satellite communication and 24-7 news cycle. But yet they have these primate genes. Artificial intelligence, a subject about which I know very little, it seems to me that it will on some level have to be derived from a particular aspect of human understanding of mm -hmm. rationalism so we're representing one aspect of our nature and prioritizing it logic uh organization but what you refer to as sort of primitive and monkey-ish for me it envelops and involves the most beautiful aspects of our nature. I'm a little romantic about human beings still. I still feel that 
I feel that one of the great problems we've had is that philosophically we have overvalued materialism, rationalism, and like you know knowing a little bit about philosophy primarily from that bloody podcast that you and I tagged a minute ago before we was recording. Who's yeah, that guy? Philosophize this. So like what, <coughs> what I understand for that is like post enlightenment, we've started to prioritize rationalism. So if you prioritize rationalism and organization, which obviously has a lot to offer, the organization of resources is incredibly and hugely important. You forget that a huge part of the human experience is nothing to do with that. The other thing we were chatting about before we went live was DMT. Now, no artificial intelligence is going to understand that there is access to a, a realm of consciousness that continually exists that doesn't seem to be bound by physical laws as we understand them and if the physical laws that we abide by are parochial and relevant only to this level of existence why are we allowing ideas resourced from there to govern all of our systems you know even listen to you talk about DMT and you say I encountered these gestures I, the gestures I went through this membrane into another realm and checking out Mike Tyson when he was on here and he, no no mm. no yeah I love that <laughs> that moment was amazing <laughs> <laughs> um, like, uh, like, uh, like that. Clear, like you know, I only I took acid when I was a teenager, and even in very unhealthy, not unhealthy, but bl unbridled, mad teenage boy conditions, I you know I want to be there with a guy in a lab coat with a pen, going, well, Mr. Brand, sit down, look at these raw shash tests. Instead of which, I'm in New Cross in a bed, sit, dropping acid and staring at my own hands and recognizing, oh my God, I'm not me. The very idea of me is a construct. I'm just tuned into a particular aspect. AI will build systems. That are, that are predicated on rationalism, organisation. And I, on, on, on that basis, I can see why they would at some point, yeah, go all Skynet and annihilate us. But that is... A sm I believe the problem with our society is that the materialistic aspect of our nature is not the priority. It's just one thing we should be doing. Of course we need good roads, of course we need hospitals, schools, food, etc. But we need to find a way of honouring the sacred. And I'm fascinated in the experiences you're having in these psychedelic explorations and how it's influencing the rest of your life. Like how you're saying, like how you're, how does it influence the rest of your decisions, the way you see the world, the way you see relationships, the way you see the vulnerable young man you were prior to building your own I say personal religion of martial arts excellence in your chosen field of stand-up comedy how do you incorporate that vulnerable kid because I'm still very aware of the vulnerable person I was and like I'm going on a rant man That's like, good. Um, like when Kevin Hart was on here who I think is amazing and he was amazing on this I thought fucking hell like what have I got to offer the world when Kevin Hart has got this kind of force <laughs> like, yeah. you, know, you don't come in the bubble and I was like my god this guy is so positive what a role model what mm. a lot he's got to offer and then I thought well like any of us what I've got to offer is who I am just who I am as mm. a vulnerable flawed human being that still feels connected to the kid I was when I didn't feel good enough I still feel that I can walk in a room and feel that yeah. but I also know that that's, that's not real because I've had spiritual experiences hallucinogenic experiences that make me feel that the relationships we should be building have to honour that we are both we're vulnerable and flawed but also capable of greatness there has to be room for all of this and I feel that part of what we're doing and part of why we're experiencing such superficial polarity in politics and culture is because we're not acknowledging that underneath this surface activity of left, right, left, right, and you know from Sam Harris, them little experiments, you stick garbage in front of a, someone, they become Republican pretty quickly, or you, you, know, mm -hmm. you scare people, they become less democratic. You know, I think all that stuff is pretty superficial, and at depth, in that realm of the jesters and the membrane of psychedelia, we have access to oneness, and that should be what's influencing the way we set up our tribes, our systems, and our relationships. Yeah, and I think when a guy like Kevin Hart shows you what a, a positive and motivational uh, impact one person can have just with his words and his deeds and the way he lives his life. He's so inspirational that you realize uh, that, that that is possible, that you, you can share that energy and that you can have these experiences with people where they literally do actually, they actually uplift you. Like I, I was uplifted by his yeah. conversation. I felt like, wow, that guy is so positive. What a great way to look at the life that we're, we're living. And yeah. the more people do that, the better. And when someone like that does spread a positive message, you know, and obviously he's got, he's materialistic as well. He's got a bunch of cars and a big house and he makes a lot of money and he does a lot of movies, but 
what he's spreading is this very motivational, very positive message. And that affects people in a very positive way too. And all that left, right shit and all this, uh, the, the, all the, the battles that we have politically and ideologically back and forth and all the negative venom that people spray at each other. At the end of the day, the, this it's not benefiting anyone unless you're fighting some a major demon that the world needs to conquer. And most of the most of it's not that. Most of it is like finding demons out of innocuous things, you know. Yeah. And I think when you talk about what what you have to offer, what you have to offer is that you are you, that you have this unique perspective. You you can affect the way people view their own journey in life because you've been so introspective and so aware of your own pros and cons in terms of your past behavior, your current behavior, and who you are now and who you used to be. All that stuff is fuel for people because they can relate. They hear it. I mean, maybe they cannot relate to being a movie star and being this famous guy and the struggle, but they can relate to the humanity of your struggle. They put themselves in your position. Like, what must that have been like? And look at this guy who's made these conscious decisions to not be like that anymore. And he dresses like a homeless person with a crazy beard. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real take-home information. Dress like you live out of doors. <laughs> yeah, dress like you're a homeless guy in Oregon. <laughs> people, oh, specifically there, people Portland. will respect that. Yeah, it's like dark colors, you know, it rains a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. I get the reference. I understand American culture, Joe Rogan. Yeah, so, um, hey, can I do some like yeah, promotional tell activity? Tell me what it's called. What is it? This book is called Mentors, and mm. I actually I re like I read it, bits of it again because I knew I was coming here. Here. and How i think it's actually it pretty helped. good awesome. like i wrote quite a lot about brazilian jiu-jitsu <laughs> you really from, love it huh yeah i do my writing is not from a you'll understand not from a technical perspective i'm not saying this mm -hmm. is what i've got to say on open guard right, <laughs> right, right, right. to transition i'm talking about how the psychological impact that it's had on me and mm -hmm. also in there about like the protocols of going to a group which as a beginner are very relevant like you touched on how ritualized it is i've got a hunch that the more we emulate and connect to original ways of human behavior whether that's dietary or hierarchies or organization of groups i feel that we will feel a sense of greater connection now the, the thing i got from going in bjj classes genesis where i go in back in england is like that all the white belts get changed at one end of the room the purple belts and above get changed at the other end of the room which coincidentally or not is where the control for the timer is and the control for the music is and where the kit is that's all up that room so end of the room so all the control is that end that it begins with sort of dance around in a circle doing all of those various exercises now lift your knees now do the shrimping and that kind of stuff it's that a lower belt shouldn't invite a higher belt to spar or roll you know it's a, and like the, as you say the amount of respect the bowing the handshaking at mm. the end of it it's so sort of it provides such a safe I environment in which to deal with the primal i can see why it's valuable and it's the, like you know I should have been taught that shit when I was 14, 13, mm. like as mandatorily, so that I didn't come across it. Like, you know, you're not going to be setting fire to fields and allotments and putting frogs on fireworks if you've got a way of dealing with that primal energy yeah. when, when it's coming. Some when people that don't understand that think that you should suppress it somehow. You should just ignore it or suppress it. They don't understand that it, wow. for men, it really, for a biological male, it really needs to be tackled head on. I mean, you really, you really need to... In embrace what it is to be a physical male and it frees you in a lot of ways do you think this might be a comparable moment to in the 1960s when there was a sort of a sense of sexual repression versus sexual free love you know the images of woodstock and flowers mm -hmm. in their hair and smoking joints and having sort of sex outdoors <coughs> in mud or possibly wheat that that, <laughs> that this time of like a kind of an <clears throat> anger about maleness you yeah. know and, and maleness may not as you said it may be a biological male but it could be the energy of i don't know assertion or whatever these like you know as in grammar yeah. male and female relate to certain words as in french grammar where i don't know cat is female and dog is male i don't know the system i don't speak french but i'm saying that these we have labeled these energies and it does seem that uh, that there is a particular 
what do I want to say, a condemnation of male energy. A co- yeah. Do you think you think it comes from a misunderstanding? Yeah, and I also think it comes from a big generalization too. I yeah, mean, it's, it's easy to do, right? And and if you're a woman who's had negative experiences with men, maybe you've dated men that have been physically abusive, or maybe you've known men that have been physically abusive, and you you're around that, and you just uh, it's it's very convenient and very easy to just generalize and decide that all men are negative and yeah. that ma- masculine energy is negative and especially white males. And if you say that, you'll get p- props online. People go, yes, girl, yes, clap, clap, clap. People get excited. But those are also people that are short-sighted. Like you want to make as many people your ally as you can. You want to make as many people your friend as you can. And you have to understand that there's some people that are just wired different than you. There's some, there's some girly girls and there's some really feminine men. And then there's some masculine men, and then and it, but everybody is okay as long as they respect you and they're kind to each other. But the problem is we associate certain behaviors and characteristics with either negativity or hedonism or uh, a toxic masculinity or someone being a, a bitch as a man, and that's these generalizations are often way more harmful and just it's just too convenient and easy and lazy yeah there the is no part. simple way and I, when i think about my own attitudes in this area there is a degree of complexity because i've got young daughters i've got a two-year-old and a one-year-old right and they're you know daughters so like but when the other day um because i'm staying in los angeles gabby she's mexican she used to be when i first moved out here and lived my entourage lifestyle she used to look after the house and she used to think oh my baby my baby she loved me so and i'd like i'll Mm -hmm. take a matriarchal figure wherever i can find one and gabby used to look after me she adored me and stuff i stayed friends with her yesterday she come around she bought like uh like what I can only describe as a bikini for like my baby daughter. <laughs> like now, what a two-year-old doesn't need like a, like right. a bikini like right. top. And I excuse me, burping on the mic. I like it, it for me. I thought like oh, I don't want to put my daughter in that. That's sort of in a way Sexualized. sexualizing yeah. the like that child and like coverage. So and also a lot of the time, like with my daughter, I don't like with my wife, particularly with our first child. I'm like, don't dress her up in little dresses and stuff because she won't be able to like run around. And I thought, my God, I'm not. That's not that different from like the, the cliche of a male parent that wanted a son and I didn't want a son or you know in particular I love this kid I love Mm -hmm. this kid regardless you know it doesn't mean I love having a daughter adore her but like I am aware that these things of like dress a child this way dress a girl this way are constructs further to what we were talking about again before about Michelle Foucault we got a lot done before we went live man like when we were talking <laughs> about Michelle Foucault what he exposes a lot is that there and, and uh, uh, Deleuze Jill, Gil Deleuze is that a lot of things that we take for granted as being normal are actually constructs and when I say a child's bikini I think there's no reason for any child of any sex or gender to be wearing a bloody bikini right. so a child with tits is a terrifying idea <laughs> for, for all but a very small and terrifying percentage of the population so like that is an example of the uh, external feminization of a child like so when there's an argument a feminist argument of you know gender is a construct i can see oh yeah to a point it is there is there are constructs you can't argue, like in my opinion is you can't argue with biology chromosomes are doing what they're doing in the physical realm yeah. But like, uh, I, you know, like being a father to a daughter has made me feel like I don't obviously, and I know you have daughters or at least they do, uh, three, two. three daughters. Like, I, like I'm certainly very aware of, I don't want to push them down some culturally prescribed avenue, whether it's about right. their dress, their sexuality or anything. So I've got, you know, where do I, where am I on that dial? You know? Yeah. You got to just not put any pressure on them. And it, let them enjoy their life and let them find their path. Do, that's what it's what's weird, right? It's like I see people, they're, you know, they're getting their their daughters to dress very, very feminine with little mini skirts and stuff, and they're five years old and high heel shoes. I've seen little kids with high heel shoes. It seems very strange to me. I don't like it. Yeah. What? Well, so you know, but for me, that is being sourced from. Like, can't we can extrapolate yeah. that to? Well, then why should a twenty-year-old woman wear high heels? I mean, I've read cultural analysis. I'm sure you have. Of like, well, the lipstick is to emphasize the lips because it's mm-hmm. redolent of the vagina. The high heels is to make a woman seem more vulnerable and to accentuate aspects of body shape. Now, mm-hmm. this can be you know seen as evidence of the influence of patriarchy. You know, like, there's loads of areas where I feel like. Why are we looking for shit to argue about in this area? We're just human beings. Most of us 
the most important people in our life are of the uh, of the diff- of a different gender or sex to us you know why are we looking for arguments but i can you can see the influence of cultural forces that are you know not neutral yeah, you certainly can, but I think it should be up to the choice of the person once they're an adult. The real problem is putting pressure on them to dress one way or another and not letting them find their place. But if a woman becomes, you know, whatever age you decide and she wants to wear high heels and a skirt because she likes the way it looks, like there's nothing wrong with that either. And no. our, 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 the demonization of sexuality is also a problem. You know, the, yes. the, the, it is almost as much of a problem as people who will prey upon vulnerable people the the peop, people mm. people that think there's something wrong with being sexually attractive or something wrong with being desirable or wanting to be desirable there's nothing wrong with that either and that kind of suppression the suppression of the, these feelings that you have and this desire that you have is very unhealthy as well it's a normal thing to want to be sexual it's yeah. a normal thing to want to look good if a girl looks good in a skirt a skirt and high heels and she likes to dress like that who the fuck is anyone to say there's anything wrong with that there's nothing wrong with it it's if that's what she likes that's fine which isn't which interesting to me is particularly um in really progressive ideology they look down upon women who wear short skirts and high heels and a lot of makeup and you know open tops that show their boobs because they think that it's they're playing into the patriarchy or that they're somehow or another falling into these gender traps. Mm. But yet they celebrate that in transgender people. Mm. They celebrate that in trans m- men that transition to women and then they, they, they really doll it up. Then they're like, you go, girl. Then they're celebrating the fact that this person is embracing these traditional aspects of womanhood. Like, you see that a lot with you know, people that are celebrating trans women. So th- I find very fascinating. <clears throat> the aesthetics of uh, the sort of what would be perhaps could be referred to as sexualized dress mm-hmm. or like uh, I suppose in males expressi- expressive or garish clothing, jewelry, tattoos. In I understand in British culture that these are often indicators of class that like that it's typically the lower down the clo- class structure you are, the more likely you are to dress in a way that is exhibitive or like you know women mm. from a blue collar background dress in ways that are exposing and revealing men have leery cars and lots of tattoos and jewelry right. expressive ways of demonstrating wealth the higher you go up the class the more subtle the more dressed down yeah. no labels all that sort of stuff you know so in british culture there's a different system of like a different system for referencing it i wonder how that works in american culture with its sort of like it's evident and much discussed racial divisions like certain things uh, it seems like a subtle way of condemning particular types of womanhood that may not just be sourced from dress this way for the male gaze. It can also be a way of saying dressing that way is an indication of a lower class background or of a particular type of ethnicity. Difficult there to there say could be sure. that, but there's also the reality of males and females is there's a lot of fucking jealous people. And there's a lot of women that just don't have the type of physical body that looks good in a short skirt with high heels and you know a, a low cut shirt and they don't like when they see it in other women because they don't they're not comfortable with their own bodies they're, that there's a reality of that i mean women get as much or more hate from women as they ever do from men and particularly if women find you to be too uh overtly sexual with the way you dress or behave that you are you're you know you're damaging male female relationships you're damaging the dynamic particular office dynamics if there's one girl in the office that likes to tramp it up you know and she's uh and all the guys are paying attention to her women will get mad at her I um, did an interview a while ago where I sort of talked about like parenting our kids me and my wife how we parent our kids and I said like uh you know, it goes, oh, I have to be honest, my wife is much the more dominant parent. She's much more practical than I am, right? And, like, stuff that got, that got, like, really negatively written about. People say, like, I go, she changes more diapers than I do and stuff, right? No, like, it's like, not like I don't change diapers or whatever. It's just my wife, you know, regardless of our respective sexes, is the more efficient, dominant parent. She's much more likely with, like, with me, if my daughter goes... I want that chocolate. The answer to for me is, oh, yeah, all right. You know, like, like I can't bear to see the the 
resistance, the emotional explosion. I concede much too early. I tap out very quickly mm. with, with my two-year-old. My wife is much more, no, let's play the long game, let's bring up a child that's not governed mm-hmm. by impulses like you. And I spoke, in fact, to that Gabor Mate, that expert on addiction. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. And he says, because of your own anxiety and pain from your own childhood, with no disrespect to my magnificent parents, uh, like you can't handle seeing your kid suffer so you like straight away you bail and do what she wants and stuff now the like so there's so much complexity in the reality of our personal little domestic relationship and i'm certainly will not saying and everyone else should run their household in that manner as well and so mm-hmm. help me god any man that changes it up you know but the way it was reported is like that's what uh, happens i think in modern media is they change what you say then you have to defend what they said you said and you yeah. think, well that ain't what i meant i'd like you know i'm not saying that, that because my wife is a woman she should take more domestic you know, i'm just saying that in our household she seems to have a set of attributes and characteristics that make her um, take control of that aspect of parenting. And it's like the the desire to judge, condemn and object is pr- the priority as opposed yeah. to, you know, no one's looking to go, oh, that's, you know, who cares or what, you know. Well, it's also that they're doing it publicly. So they're doing it most, I mean, if you're, you're either reading comments or you're reading articles. And if you're reading articles, they're just looking for something to be upset about. They watch you and they'll say, okay, is this a viable target? Yes, we got confirmation. What he said about changing diapers or his wife being a better parent is a viable target. Let's go after him. And then they just formulate some bullshit argument about who you really are based on what might have been a throwaway or a concession to your wife or even just a compliment to your it wife. Was a compliment. Self-deprecating that to is yourself. What it was. Yeah, but I it doesn't. Just, people not. They're not looking at things rationally. They're just looking at targets. It's p- particularly people that write articles. You know, what's the best article? It's got to be negative. Like one of the things that came out of all this uh, Facebook algorithm stuff is you find out that Facebook realized somewhere early on that the way to encourage engagement is to get people upset. They they get way more engaged and they go back and forth and and inter, interact with these posts way more if they're upset than they do if they agree with it. If they agree with it, they might give it a like or a thumbs up and say, hey, that's great. And that's it. That's where it ends. But if, you know, someone's talking about, you know, we shouldn't build the wall. We should let everyone in. And you put that on some fucking Trump guy's page and they, ah, it's crazy. I mean, you will get thousands and thousands and thousands of interactions. Mm. And so Facebook realized that the way to keep people and, you know, they could claim that that it's an algorithm and the Uh algorithm just supports whatever the people are really interested in. But what they're interested in is conflict. That demonstrates my earlier point, which I made up on the spot, that AI <laughs> is not a neutral thing. It is right. resourced from human perspectives and because that is a type of AI, you know, not, as, not yeah. as complex as like, what we're going to experience and I can't even imagine. But what I'm saying is, is it's still... Uh, what I want to say, resourced from a human from a human perspective, yeah. and yes, of course, we are evolved to respond more strongly to negativity than positivity for loads of reasons, and I think that's where we can stitch back to what we were saying about taking personal responsibility for who you are, like that. None of us have to sit on social media going, fuck you, fuck you. you know, right. like none of us have to do that. We can try and resolve those. I, I respect that some people don't have any other outlets. They don't have the privileges I have of being able to go to support groups where people openly talk about, this is the ways that I felt inferior today. This is the ways that I'm trying to become a better man and a better father and a better co-worker. You know, like a lot of people aren't afforded those environments and probably the best shot they got is having a go at someone online and those people, you know, in a way deserve love and sympathy. But until Until we, on some level, recognize that we can alter our own behaviors, we can alter our own consciousness, I don't don't see how there's going to be... Well, at least then we can create a terrain upon which a better better systems can start to flourish. Do you read comments? No. I actually, <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm too sensitive. I can just about manage to listen to people's replies to yeah. my conversation. Like, you know, like, sort of, like, yeah, I don't go on to, like, I have a, like, I work with someone who does my social media and, like, sh- she gives me stuff, like, here, yeah, I'll respond to these things, put some output on that, because I don't, uh, I don't want to engage with that. I don't yeah. want to, like, walk up and down any street knocking on the door going, do you like me? Do you like me do you like me i don't don't want to deal with people's responses in various conditions well it's also much like the articles the way people get a response out of you or the way to people to get your reaction is to say something really negative you Mm. know you'll you look at some sometimes when people are not that savvy when it comes to social media one things that one of the things that you'll notice is they'll interact and i've been guilty of this in the past before i sort of realized what i was doing you would 
only respond to negative things. Like people are arguing with people. Meanwhile, people are saying nice things to you and you <laughs> ignore them. Yeah. It's because you don't, you don't, you, at a certain level, you don't have the physical time. It doesn't exist to respond to everyone. It's not possible. There's no, if you get 13,000 comments on one of your posts, how the fuck does anyone have time to respond to 13,000 people? You can't. And then you have email and you have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And it's just, there's no way. It's, there's not enough time in this world. So, so, so you would personally would have responded to things that caused the more visceral. Yeah, if I saw someone saying something that was untrue, I'd be like, fuck you, that's untrue. But then I realized, like, what do you, why? Like, yeah. what are you doing? Like, you, this is a new thing for people. There's never been a time where people have had this instantaneous interaction with people, unfiltered, unmoderated, uh, globally. Yeah. I mean, it's very strange to, to be able to do that and to be able to go back and forth and just, just to be able to give your comments on things, to be able to talk about things. It's very addictive to people. Yeah, that's right. And that's why I'm very cautious with it. I have to sort of yeah. set my life out like I'm essentially a monk in a marriage. That's mm. basically where I live. Get up, meditate, do yoga, do exercises, do things that are positive for you. Watch the way that you're thinking. I'm interested in where, again, in with your own, do you feel... Uh, connected to the person you were as an adolescent do you notice it in your own parenting do you notice it in the type of choices you make because the image i have of you from the outside is like that you have literally built something for yourself you operate within it and you are quite protected and you are independent and not forced to deal with too many negative outside influences but in unavoidable dynamics the unnecessary dynamics like uh, you know as a father and dealing with colleagues and stuff like that do you experience a lot of tension anxiety what 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 has happened to that guy do you feel that you have transcended that because i do in my own life feel like yeah I've, i'm not the adolescent boy i was i've like you know i've learned from that and i still in a very sort of cod psychological way you know when i'm doing uh hibiro that's the G bjj classes i'm doing over here with mm -hmm. uh, professor ricardo wilk he's an amazing guy like wh wh when i'm when i'm doing those classes i have a a sense of fathering my child self of like mm. you know because i weren't doing those kind of things when i was a kid i'm like it's all right russell we're just in a bjj class just relax <laughs> don't need to panic don't need to impress anybody right just do the if you don't know just ask right you know, i've got a voice in myself because i chatted to tony robbins you know he's like another obviously high achieving guy who i admire and respect a great deal and like you know when he talks he does like these cold plunges and he says before i get in that plunge I'm like, you're getting in that fucking plunge like he talks my god i don't talk to myself like I'm like right Russell we're going to get in the cold plunge we're going to relax you know like yeah. I have to talk to myself gently what are you doing with that aspect of yourself do you still have a relationship with it how is it like when you're doing all these psychedelic cosmonautic explorations of the psyche are you not encountering aspects of yourself that are un, uh, if undeveloped unaddressed there's always going to be unaddressed and undeveloped aspects of yourself but I'm very 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 different to who I was when I was a young boy I mean um, I'm I'm not 100% self-actualized. I don't think anybody is, but I'm just a totally different human being. I remember it, but I remember it with humor. Like, I remember it and I laugh. I'm like, wow, so silly. I was so weird back then. And, uh, you know, with life experience and developing confidence and understanding of who you are and why you had those feelings and why you were insecure and why you had so much self-doubt, martial arts helped me with uh, with that tremendously because it was the first thing that I ever did where I didn't feel like a loser. Mm. It's like the first thing that I ever did where people like respected me and they liked me for it. You know, I'm like, wow, this is like some, this a, it was a feeling that I was completely unused to in the 14 previous years of my life. All of a sudden there was this, this feeling that I was unusual. I was unique. I was special. Wow. You know, I was appreciated. You were good at it quick. Yeah, you? I was. I had a natural inclination towards it, oh, and amazing. I was obsessed with it. So I was obsessed with it. So I was training every day, all day long. And then my instructor recognized it really early on. So he uh, allowed me to train there for free, and just I would teach classes. And teaching classes helped me a lot as well because when you're teaching, you're breaking down techniques, and you're, you know, you when you're showing someone how to do it, you're really cementing those pathways in your own mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That must be an important step on the road to mastery. I see that clip where Eddie Bravo gave you your black belt, and you were very moved by that. Like, so for me, that like moments like that, it must connect you 
to the beginning of the journey. Yeah, that does. Yeah, for sure. And but still, you know, the the journey of jujitsu is a fascinating one because unless you're someone who's you know a Salu Hibero or a John Jacques Machado or just a, a true master who's dedicated their entire life to it, the journey's so long. It's so long. It's like if you're a guy who runs, you like to run, I like to run a mile three or four days a week, no big deal. But then, you know, your next door neighbor is an ultra marathon runner is preparing for the, the Moab 240 where he's going to run 240 miles. You're just, you're never going to catch up the same amount of times. And you should always defer to that person when you have questions about running. And that's how it is with jujitsu. Like, is, you know, yeah, I'm a black belt, but I'm not a black belt like John Jacques Machado is a black belt. Is that there's levels to even to that. So I always have questions. So the journey is never over. It's always long. There's always a, a better way to get out of an arm bar or a better way to set up a triangle or whatever it is. There's the, the, one of the beautiful things about jujitsu is that it's so complex. There's so many very Variables. There's so many situations and interactions and exchanges and entries and defenses and 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 way to chain moves together and the, the correct way to set something up two three steps ahead to know that if you grab the lapel this way the guy's gonna try to shake it off that way and that exposes this which exposes that and then the next defense will expose this and then you keep going and going and going and going until you get them. It's so beautiful to watch yeah. that because it's like as if there's a pre-existing net or grid of interrelated signs that will work together. And like as a white belt, I've got three stripes now. I was like, so I was thanks. I was really hoping that by the time I came back on here, I would have a blue belt and like I'd You're be closing to, in on it. I'm really How often out. you train? I'm training three times a week privates and I'm attending two classes. And what I've done... That's is, great. Thanks a lot. And what's a significant step for me is like now in the classes, when I'm sparring with people, I don't try just in the handshake to manipulate them into going easy. <laughs> <laughs> I say, God, you look so lovely today. Oh, right, off we go then. <laughs> <laughs> Will you try to manipulate people? Yeah, like just a subtle gesture or something yeah, like that. Right, <laughs> right, right. Just try to take it easy on me. <laughs> Come on, don't hurt me. Come on, look Do you at me. Uh, avoid big people? People. yeah sometimes like i try and stay down that white belt end of the room but like mm -hmm. now the more i do it like the more they coax me up there great yeah. big giant men like uh like there's a guy that goes like the sort of ones up our like the hard end purple belt and above dave uh paul busby and like there's people like their hands and their feet look different to my hands and feet as different <laughs> uh, the, their hands and feet are as different from mine as mine are to my daughter's right and I feel like how am I supposed to ever yeah. do anything with these people like hard water like drowning in hard water the way they move and <laughs> fold around me I'm like, oh, what, what, like, what am I supposed to do and my breathing goes yep. like, but the thing is with other white belts is that uh, what I feel is like there is my ego comes back in because yeah. there's so I feel like no I should be getting something. The first time I got choked out by another white belt, I, like, I was. I felt like I went into a room I'd not been in since I was 16, getting my head kicked in in bus stops, you know, and stuff like that. I felt like I was quiet for 24 hours, just sitting and reflecting on, oh, shit. And I had to speak to other people. Like, shit, this is a combat sport. This happens. You're going to experience. Right, right. So it doesn't mean I'm a bad person <laughs> that I've failed. No, no, you're going to have to get used to that yeah, if you're going you to be doing this. you get used to humiliation. You get used to defeat but it's it's that humbling is very good for you you know i mean I, I don't know how many times i've been tapped out in my life but it's probably more than a thousand it's probably yeah. probably thousands you know and just, that, the, yeah and there uh you sit there while i tell you about jujitsu and the other <laughs> and the other thing that's been good about it is like when it is the other way like i remember like a guy that was a big guy on top of me and like i was he I, he was in mount right mm -hmm. and I, like he weren't actually applying a submission but there's just the sheer discomfort of having someone there their body their sweat their hair <laughs> their abdomen their reproductive organs their digestive system feces in their bowel on uh. top of me i just nearly <laughs> tapped out of that but then he went to move to get an armbar and i thought hang on a second there's a moment and i managed to escape from that and like the amount of energy that that released was like fuck you <laughs> justice <laughs> <laughs> now I win <laughs> Justin That's hilarious Yeah, yeah, yeah It's a very man. satisfying feeling It's also very satisfying to, to defend against something That someone used to catch you with Like say if someone's really good at taking your back yeah. And they choked you a couple times And then one time they take your back But you defend and you get out You're like I got out Yes. Like oh there's an escape I can make this I'm getting better 
I love being in the cave, that mental space, because what my technique was, oh, I'm not good at that. Never bother trying. I'm not mm. good at that kind of stuff. Never bother trying. So for me, at this stage in my life, to go and do something that I'm not good at, that's with other men, that's competitive, that involves so much vulnerability and failure and learning, I'm thinking, well, you've, you're growing. You've got to be growing because you're doing stuff that you never would have done before. Even turning up at a new place like I'm doing here in LA and making those new relationships and doing doing that you know it's amazing for me another thing i'm into is the integrity of it right because chris clear a uh, uh, black belt under uh, hodger gracie right in uk my teacher like if he gave me a blue belt that would look good man it would be videoed it would i would tweet it it would be everywhere oh russell brand got a blue belt this shit must yeah. work but no he doesn't do it out of integrity and respect for that you know it means more to him yes. evidently than a sim the act of kindness mm. <laughs> you know so like what is nice to belong to something that has protected and valuable systems he did say to me you keep going by the end of the year blue belt i think but like uh you know it's not dished out like it's yes. nice to know that there's some kind of order a, a, an area where celebrity manipulation charm mm. humor none of those things all redundant all redundant no in jujitsu it's very protected anyone that gives out a bad belt it's very bad for their integrity it's the 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 school would lose face so badly in the community and you meet someone who's uh, a hicks and gracie brown belt that motherfucker is a Hicks and Gracie brown belt. He's as legit as they get. They don't uh. get any more legit. Like if you got to that point of Hicks and Gracie gives you a brown belt, it's a dis it's irrefutable. And that's how it should be. And it's a beautiful thing about the art form is that it has this self-correcting sort of aspect to it that when you roll, when you spar with each other, it your ability or lack of is exposed and there's no other way around it. Yeah. That's good to not avoid that. Yeah, it's good no, not to avoid gotta, that reality. Gotta, but you'll be better. You know, you're you're a fit guy. You're a healthy guy. If you just keep going, get off that fucking vegan diet and keep going. I watched a documentary <laughs> um, called What the Health. Have you seen yeah, it? It's, like, yeah, it's filled with a lot of propaganda. And oh, nonsense. propaganda. Damn, those guys it again, is. like the Nazis. I remember well, them. It, it's, they used a lot of discredited studies, and the, there's a lot of epidemiology studies that will connect things. That epidemiology, does that, what does that mean, like an epidemic? Well, you could, no, we could pull up what the actual It's about time Jamie pulled something up in this episode. Epidemiology, but the way I would describe it is they would do these studies, and essentially it would be they would they would ask you what you eat on a daily basis how often do you eat meat how and it's basically a survey and in in that survey they would say well there's a direct correlation between people that eat meat and diabetes so mm. let's pull up the definition oh, i see but the problem is what is causing here a branch of medicine which deals with incidents distribution and possible control of diseases and other factors relating to health mm. um so when they're when they're dealing with incidents, right? They're dealing with uh, how often do you eat red meat? How often do you eat this? How often do you eat that? And then they find, oh, well, there's more instances of, of diabetes in people that eat meat. Okay, but is it people that eat meat and vegetables, or is it people that eat meat and vegetables and diet mm. coke and and sugary sodas mm. and ice cream and French fries? And how are they eating their meat? Are they eating cheeseburgers from some bullshit fast food place, or are they eating grass fed steak? I are they see. eating grass fed steak and and vegetables? And there's very little evidence that shows there's anything wrong with eating meat if you follow a normal, healthy, what they would call a primal diet. Yeah. Meaning, cut out all the grains, cut out all the sugar, cut out all the bullshit, eat vegetables and meat. And there's almost nothing. I mean, unless you have some very unusual, rare condition where you're either allergic to meat or you have some uh, very strange uh, uh, digestive system where you, you have allergies to it or you have real problems digesting it or you have real problems with high cholesterol foods which is very rare as well most of what you're getting is vegan propaganda people that want other people to be convinced that the way that they're living is the correct way and that eating meat is is physically bad for you and is causing all these harms what's causing all the harm for people physically is the modern american diet and that's been pretty right. established yes that's right and there, there are clear ethical reasons to be vegan in that it takes you out of the exploitation of animals but that documentary yes. what the health that i watched was like you know and i've been vegetarian for years and this like and i've gone back and forth to veganism because i feel god jesus christ man there's enough things in my life i'm not doing without not being <laughs> out i have an egg 
without feeling but guilty for But you can have pasture-raised eggs if you get them from a good farm. The, the chickens are just hanging out. I've man. got chickens in my garden. I'm yeah. not confident in these animals and the Why? way they go. Well, one by one, slowly, my dogs eliminate in oh, the gift I've of had life. That a few, <laughs> I've had that a few times. <laughs> Terrible feeling. I lost nine of them to coyotes just last month. Maybe two months ago. That's a pretty heavy. It was, it was a death heavy toll. toll. Yeah. Well, we had a fire out here, and the chicken coop burnt down. We got a smaller chicken coop, and the coyotes figured out how to get into it when we weren't home, and we came home to just feathers everywhere. It was disgusting. Oh, that's brutal. That they're they're brutal little monsters. Those coyotes. Yeah, yeah, but, they're you know, ungovernable. They're the reason why we don't have rats everywhere, too. All right, so yeah, yeah. Hey, it's the circle of life. The yeah. Lion King was right. So like, hey, though. Um, the thing that about that vegan documentary, mate, is that it it tuned in to my pre-existing belief when it said stuff like, oh, the Diabetes Association, yes. they are funded by these meat and dairy organizations and these pharmaceutical companies. The cancer uh, organization similarly accepts donations yeah. from these organizations. And it made me recognize, like my pre-existing idea that I come to it with is, you know, like that whole pyramid of these are the things you should eat. Bread, mm -hmm. milk, you know, it just were the things that it was easy to, and cheap to produce yeah, and that were right. profitable. Um, well, they used to think that. They really did used to think that bread would, and grains were the most important thing. Do you think they felt that? I think they did. I think they thought it was it was filling and it provided energy, and I don't think they understood. Well, there was no talk of gluten intolerance when we were young. It didn't exist. No, and there was no was understanding of excess carbs, and how excess carbs leads to excess body weight, and it makes, it makes you store fat. And it, it, people didn't think about it that way. They didn't understand. There, there was... The thing about nutrition is that nutrition science is a, it's a body of knowledge that's constantly added to. Yeah, and in fact, perhaps most things are. Who knows what misapprehensions and ignorance we toil under yeah. that will be revealed to us. Do you do any, uh, I feel like I've heard you talk about h hormone stuff. Yeah, yeah, I do what, hormone rep replacement therapy. What type of things? Testosterone and human growth hormone. Do you have to give yourself a jab in the ass? Yeah, you get in the thigh. Thigh. You won't yeah. do the arse out you of can. simple pride. No, it doesn't Fine. matter. Not going near that. That's for Mrs. Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't touch that. Your thigh's right there. It's easy to grab. When you're right. reaching back to put in your ass, it's just like an awkward thing. <laughs> Too vulnerable. Um, yeah, but they also have... Um, uh, you're taking whole, like so. You're taking growth hormone. Mm -hmm, yeah. you, you not noticed any negative side effects or no. instability. Well, you have to get your blood monitored. You know, when you when you're doing something like that, this this is also if you're a person that has addictive problems, addiction problems, which I don't necessarily have them as much with substances. What but, do you have them with? Um, uh, well, you saw with video games. When you got here the video game problem that I have. Yeah, you frantic. You emerged yeah. out of that dark room. You and your Sweaty. pals, sweaty <laughs> and pie-eyed and baffled by the well, real world. It's very fun too. Um, martial arts. I've been addicted right. to martial arts. I've been addicted to playing pool. I get addicted to uh, getting good at things. I get very addicted to things. If there's something that I get obsessed with, like jujitsu or whatever it is, I get obsessed, and that's yeah. all I think about all day long. Yeah. I just had. I just you know, it's not healthy. But with um, hormones, you want to make sure that you don't overdose yourself. You want to make sure that you stay within a very narrow range where you're, you know, you're, you have what are the healthy levels of uh, a person that's in their, you know, late 20s. That's, right. that's really what you want. You don't want to have hyperhuman levels, which some people do do. Hyperhuman, you're going to create yeah, they, odd, an odd ecosystem. Well, you're fucking up your body, man. You're just jolting yourself with all this extra shit. What are you about to take? The, the sweet lady thyroid. Oh. Is that part of your system? Yeah, I have. Um, I take Armor Thyroid. It's actually made from pig's thyroids. What do you mean pig's thyroids now? Yeah. What, like, hold on, where they, how, what's happened to the pig? Dead, dead. They're long gone. They're not sort of struggling a with a lack of thyroid. Yeah, that's teetering a about all emasculated. Well, this is like, so, yeah, I'm interested in this hormone stuff. I'm interested in that. But, you know, me, I've got to be very, very, like, cautious mm -hmm. about mood altering yes. uh, stuff. Yeah. But uh, if you have uh, the exercise regimen that you're talking about, I don't think you're going to have Got to get that, that blue belt. I'm going to do what it takes, man. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Bring me the pig. It'll help I'll you. suck that th- thyroid out of it directly. You should eat eggs, though, man. You really should. You should eat. You should eat some animal protein without. I mean, if you oppose uh, the moral aspect of killing an animal, which I totally understand and appreciate, and that's what led me to become a hunter in the first place, is that I was really uncomfortable watching these animal rights videos of uh, factory farming. I thought it was disgusting. I was like, I don't want to participate in this. Yeah, it's reprehensible. Hunting is a different thing, man. To me, hunting is this intense. It's very spiritual in a way. Mm. I mean, people don't get it because they see you celebrating when it's over because it's very, very, very difficult to close in on a wild animal. What are you hunting? Mostly elk. Well, elk's my favorite for two reasons. One, it's very delicious, super nutritious. Also, if I shoot one elk, I can eat it for like eight months. What are you doing? Like freezing them? Of salting yeah, them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Freezing them. Freezing them. So you're out stalking an elk on the yeah. plains. Yeah. Where are you? Like near where you live? You just go Utah, out. Utah. Do you travel great. on bikes travel. or something? How do you no, follow you can. them? Uh, yeah, well, you do travel on bikes if you uh, whitetail hunt. A lot of times you'll go into the woods with bikes because they don't leave a scent the way your feet do. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, animals don't associate the sound of a bike the way they associate it with like the sound of stepping, bipedal hominids wow. stepping towards They've evolved, them. right? Uh-oh, yeah. bipedal. Yeah, they see you on a bike. They don't even freak out as much. Delightful. Like, Never seen that like, before. What's that? What oh, these, my brain! What are these things? Yeah. 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 So, elk, are they like herd animals? So you just yes. see like a herd of yeah. them? Yeah. Yeah, you see a herd of them and you try to figure out which way the wind's blowing and you try to get close to them. Is this a video of us? Yeah, this is oh, a video wow. of us from... Uh, what a beautiful place. Oh, I mean, I can see the Utah harmony Mountains. of nature. Yeah, oh, so that's God. an elk. Now, the thing is with me, I see that elk there and yeah. I sort of feel like a sort of I've watched too much Disney. Yeah. Um. You know, like I see that elk and I feel like I'm Bambi, literally. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I, like I don't have it, it. Like, is that early in the morning? You look. Yeah. Tired. Not tired. Might you know. be late afternoon, actually. Can I, you I tell? I think that was late afternoon. Yeah. Like, say, so, like. I, from that position, I couldn't, like, I would love the game mm. of being able to aim, because actually I've had to go down gun ranges, it turns out I'm a pretty good shot, and it's mm. nice to see that thing come back with, like, holes around its abdomen and its head, right. and I think, satisfied, <laughs> there, you've been dealt with, paper man, <laughs> but, but like, the elk, I couldn't, I've got too much empathy mm. in me that I, like, I couldn't deal with the feeling of after it was yeah. shot, I like it, like almost thinking about it, the sentimentality of it. I've sentimentalized it now. You know, at least I don't eat meat and stuff like that, so it's not like I have all those feelings, of, but can handle it in a packaged, portioned off way. Yeah, it's just I feel too much like oh that creature. So what in your head when you're doing it, when you're pulling the trigger, you're not having what's going on in your mind. Well. You you only are hunting these mature animals that have already passed on their genes. You also are recognizing that if you're not killing these things, they're not. It's not like they're going to live forever. They, right. they are. They live a short life. A short life with a very violent death. It's either wolves or mountain lions or bears or something's going to take them out. Yeah. And what you're doing is essentially dipping your toe into the natural world. Mm. And I've heard the argument that well, this is ridiculous because everyone can't do that. You know, if everyone went out and hunted all the animals, there would be no animals left, which is true. But um, I'm not everyone. And yeah. so I don't, you know, you can't I mean, really use that if everyone did it argument. It's a good argument because you, you, if you're encouraging people to hunt, it is kind of a good argument because it's not realistic. It's not sustainable. But the other thing to recognize is that the reason why most of this wildlife exists in the first place, a lot of it was wiped out in the early um, 20th century from um, what they call market hunting. In the late, late 19th century, early 20th century, um, they you know, they didn't have refrigeration and uh, it was hard to get food and we didn't have the same sort of large scale agriculture that we have today. And so when someone would want meat, they would, uh, someone would either have to hunt it for you and you would go to the market and and get that hunted food or uh, you would go out and do it yourself. Mm. And they basically wiped out most of the wildlife in North America to the point of extinction, whitetail, deer, elk. They've been extirpated from the majority of their range in North America and only been replaced in a, a few other places. But the places where they've been replaced, it's all through money that was generated through hunting tags, all through billions and billions of dollars. There's a thing called the uh, Robertson-Pickman, I think that's what it's called, Act, 
where uh, 10%, if you buy hunting gear and equipment, 10% of that money goes to habitat restoration, um, making sure that uh, rangers and forest people get funded. So there's uh, mm. the fish and game department gets funded and all and also population conservation, making sure that the populations are healthy, repopulating certain areas with elk and deer. And this has all been done through the money that's generated through hunting. Yeah, I can see that there's a, looking at my own feelings towards it, I can see that there's a potentially I'm bringing a sentimentality to the idea of animals that's like anthropomorphic. Yes. Like I'm like, oh, you can't kill that. It, what about its babies? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like I'm thinking about things like that. Um, but what I, you know, I live in a rural area in Britain where like hunting is normal and I wouldn't, and agriculture is normal and I wouldn't get very far if I was sort of like, you can't shoot those pheasants, look at their feathers, they're beautiful. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like it wouldn't, it's not a helpful attitude. So whilst I like record, like in myself, I couldn't do that because yeah. like I don't, it messes me up on a sort of a, feels like a very sort of deep visceral level, like, you know, like, but I feel that. Like, this is precisely the kind of territory where we have to look at acknowledging and tolerating difference between us. This is where I feel like the sort of these ossified, polarized positions between right and left are starting to take root. Because if someone like me who don't eat meat, don't eat animal products and wouldn't hunt for ethical reasons starts trying to impose on other people, now you shouldn't hunt because of this, that, have you not watched Bambi? You know, like that's going to mean that people aren't able to explore who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and so my per I've let go of judging people around things that I don't agree with because I reckon I don't know everything you know yeah. what I mean I'm this this is like this is about my morality is about how I behave and if people said to me I'm thinking about going hunting I'd go well these are my feelings about it however though I just heard that hunting does contribute apparently to the survival of some species and there is an argument that it's quite natural and indigenous and it's probably a way of getting in contact with who we are originally as hunting people it's an important part of our anthropological history and possibly a lot of the condemnation of hunting is part of the rejection of who we used to be as we become overly civilized and more and more mm. detached from what it is to be human whether that's sacred or pragmatic we don't know what human beings are anymore we reject our own sexuality we reject our own bodies we reject you know we're trying to turn ourselves into these sort of cyborgs these emotionless sexless mean meaningless creatures mm. where is our passion where is our connection with the sacred they would go hold on i only asked you about hunting when are you going to stop talking <laughs> never you gave me an in i will pummel you with my belief system on all things like yeah. you know like so i don't feel like that ain't where i get into judging people um but like I, i'm interested as well with this i keep bringing up the subject of dmt uh like what <sighs> I guess what I, I want to know about is like, because I, I'm, you know, obviously a person in recovery. I don't drink, I don't take drugs, haven't done for a, a, a long time. And I recognize for certain people that, that, that they, they can't do it safely. Psychedelics and hallucinogens it seem to me exist in a realm outside of that because they're not about, they're not pleasure seeking. Right. There's like, seem to me like it's a spiritual portal. However, I'm a crafty bastard when it comes to this stuff. And I'm always looking for an in, you know, when I see your, cannabis treasure trove over there mm. i mean that is some yeah as you said like raiders of the lost ark stuff and i'm holding in my hand now the cbd rich cannabis soft gels clasping it you know so like i'm fascinated. so you're worried that that is a gateway that cbd which is not necessarily psychoactive as long as it's not it, psychoactive it's not but it does help you with anxiety it helps oh. a lot of people because it alleviates a lot of uh, inflammation which tends to have a, a corresponding impact on on your anxiety Hold on. So this says here 11 milligrams of THC. Does that mean? I mean, is it says that, THC. It does say that at the bottom. It's probably a little, one to one. Is this a one to one? Might be. Or it's like an 18 to one. Or 11. It says there's an 11 uh, and a one. Yeah, there's a couple of different ones in that box. Oh, I give you. I almost gave you the wrong one. Joe, what's next? Jesus, for for you read. A bag of smack. <laughs> Don't take that. <laughs> this one goes Don't back. Don't take in. this one. This one's way more powerful. That's really? one to one. Yeah. Well, you one. seem do seem very relaxed and free yes. from anxiety. Oh, great. I will say that. Um, but like, so like. 
I, what I suppose I'm interested in because I, look, listen, I'm meditating the whole. Like I meditate mm-hmm. a lot. I'm doing all these things. I'm experiencing transcendent right. states. I'm experiencing what it's like to yeah. not feel attached to my identity as Russell. Who are you before you are Russell? Who are you before you identify uh, yourself as a man in England? Who are you? Who is the person? Who is the consciousness? Who is the awareness? Now, when I listen to say Terence McKenna talking about his experiences in psychedelia at such length and with such lucidity and with so many philosophical connotations and the way that he uses the information he's getting from hallucinogenic um, experiences to speculate on how we should organise society, what, it, it, what the implications are for freedom, his refusal to accept that there are certain kind of experiences that should be prohibited, that it's ridiculous that adults should be prevented from having that. I, I'm fascinated, but I'm also, I suppose, part of my bias is I love anything that gets me out of my head. I, I feel a tremendous sense of relief, whether it's through meditation or even sport uh, the, or sex, being relieved of the burden of the constantly thinking mind. But when I hear like those um, vivid ex- uh, descriptions of DMT realm or ayahuasca realm, I think something in me hungers for that, hungers for it. Do and you I- worry that you're trying to get intoxicated? You worry that you're you're trying to find a loophole. Yeah, because I am doing that. I'm loop. Yeah. I'm looking for a loophole. It's like I'm going around uh, like a s- sort of a trash lawyer looking for some yeah. way that I could get into. Is there? Hold on a second. What about a this trash clause? Trash lawyer. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know people that have problems with addiction that have done psychedelics and didn't have a problem, but I'm sure some people have had problems, and I don't know about them. DMT is interesting in that, first of all, it's very quick. The experience is only about 15 minutes, 20 minutes max. And it's also, it's not necessary, it's not an intoxicant in the way that you would think about traditionally. You are still you in in the face of this experience. And I think, <clears throat> I think it's some sort of a chemical gateway. That's mm. what I think. I think there's a gateway in your mind that can lead to some other dimension that's probably there all the time. If there is a... Uh omnipresent continually existing realm that human beings aren't accessing because of the particular biochemical formulation of consciousness as it is in this point in our evolution yeah. and that we can get there and it seems as like you know I've heard Terence McKenna say it's more real you know it's more real there's stuff in there yes. you know and Excuse me. And when he talks about them <laughs> beings, you know, like that he describes as self dribbling basketballs, creating yeah. like Fabergé egg, like, yeah. you know, b- b- devices through vibration. And I they're didn't telling see you to that. do it. I never saw I that. Would, that. I want He's that. He's called the machine elves. He's called them all sorts of different things. The way I've described them is uh, they're the geometric patterns made out of love and understanding. That's so, what they seem like. So you read, you can look at a geometrical pattern and read meaning into it. It had an emotional quality. They're made out of something, and they move. They change. Like, they don't stay what they are. They're constantly evolving in front of you into something more and more beautiful. It's and very weird. What did it make you feel? Like I knew nothing. <laughs> that was the most profound aspect. Like, all of this stuff that you concentrate on every day is nonsense. And there is some other thing that's connected... That's probably influencing this world. Yeah. And it's probably what, what people see when they have near-death experiences, the depictions of the afterlife. I mean, it's probably what it all is. And religious experiences. Yeah. And when p- prophets mm-hmm. are talking about, oh, my God, I went into this realm. Sure. There's these beings. They've told me we're all one. We well, have to scholars, love each other. Scholars in Jerusalem are connecting Moses' experience with the burning bush to the acacia tree, the acacia tree, which is rich in DMT. The burning Ooh. bush is what God was to Moses. And yeah. that through... Through this burning bush, he came out with these Ten Commandments of how people should live their lives. I mean, that easily could have been just a very convoluted sort of translation of a DMT trip. Certainly. And also, when you think of, certainly there are archetypal images that seem to be repeated throughout ancient cultures Mm -hmm. and archaic stories that seem to refer to the potential for plant experiences to affect consciousness even the garden of eden do yeah. not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge yeah. otherwise you will become as gods mm-hmm. you know like i sense that now if if there is some realm that we can reach through that experience that seem, that puts into perspective everything that else we experience on the material realm and that thing seems to in your words be emanating love and understanding while ever changing completely formless and communicating love and understanding it, for, i can't help but think that that should become our priority 
to have a relationship with that realm yes. and to bring about that experience. I don't even mean in a literal way, because even Terence McKenna said there are some people, vulnerable souls, he was probably referring to people like me, that probably shouldn't mess around with that kind of stuff. I think he stuff. was really talking about people with schizophrenia. Or right. People that, which he believed he had, by the way. Did he? Yeah, he, he, he had some very unique uh, perspectives on schizophrenia and the, the way people interact with the world itself. I think if we lived in a healthy world, uh, a healthy civilization that had a healthy relationship with psychoactive substances, we'd probably have centers where you would have a legitimate shaman, a medical advisor, and someone would take you through uh, a guided experience. We're doing that now with uh, ketamine. There's a lot of people that are very depressed that are having uh, these physician-controlled ketamine experiences that have had a profound effect on uh, their depression. My friend Neil Brennan's gone through several of them, and he, he was the, and he's a comedian, a very funny comedian, so when he was describing it, it was hilarious. He was oh, yeah. going to a doctor's office and tripping his fucking balls off, you know, and the doctor's shooting him up with intramuscular ketamine. Oh, my God. Yeah, and he's having these insane... I go, so you're having psychedelic experiences? He's like... Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> the way he's describing it was really funny. Um, I mean, tripping his fucking balls off in these whatever states that ketamine. I've never experienced ketamine. I don't know what it does, but it's apparently profoundly uh, hallucinogenic, and you have these wild, crazy experiences on it. And for whatever reason, it has uh, a great impact on depression for a lot of people. I think it's a perspective enhancer, but it also does something to rewire the mind. Well, what some of this suggests is that mental illness is a response to our material conditions. Whether, yes. that, whether that mental illness is schizophrenia, depression, or yeah. addiction, it's sure. like it's like people are going, oh, hang on a minute, this isn't how we're supposed to live. I took that ketamine one time towards the end of my using, and it, as usual, it's not in the right type of environment. You shouldn't be doing stuff like that in a nightclub. You need to be under that shamanic conditions white yeah. coat guy or whatever, whoever yeah. you nominate as a shaman. But I felt like it was like going into a tunnel made of sound and like mm. having to navigate i was like oh shit i'm still in reality what am i gonna do is it <laughs> as my sort of consciousness becomes a noise yeah. instead of a string of words and signs yeah. how am i gonna get out of this place you know so like for me it's clear that drugs were never meant to be recreational in fact they never were i was, like, I was never hey man this is crazy i was always like i'm in fucking pain i need some shit to help me out yeah. otherwise i'm gonna probably kill myself yeah you know so like it was a way of holding that stuff at arm's length so i guess my renewed curiosity around DMT and, ayahu and ayahuasca and other sort of plant medicines and like you know that do you know Daniel Pinchbeck and yeah. like them guys that are sort of part of that I'm curious about it because I guess I'm continually trying to find a way where someone go right here's a way where we can do it where it's sort of safe and I've heard of other people in recovery doing it but when I think about what my motivation is is when I hear people talking about and my own and my own recollections of experiencing what felt like God and by God I mean a sense of oneness and that my individual identity isn't my real identity and I'm connected to yes. everything and love is the most important thing you know I, I i want a real experience of that so that when i'm out in the world i can remember when i'm driving or when i'm dealing with people or if i'm buying something or if i'm feeling inferior or feeling superior that like you said this is bullshit this is like yeah. a secondary reality don't let it govern you you know as a someone that's been seduced by fame a person like oh, if, if i get this part in this film then everyone's gonna love me oh if this stand-up set goes well you know like a person that's placed all of my well-being outside of myself the certain knowledge that there is an inner connection that will take care of you that's accessible i guess i'm you know hungry to sort of mm -hmm. feel it in a way that's like oh my god now there is no doubt so in a sense it's a, a crisis of faith not but a crisis some of faith psychedelic of faith. states that you could achieve without uh, taking anything i mean you could certainly get there um in a flotation tank you mm. could get there through holotropic breathing um i've never done kundalini yoga but apparently the people that get really deep into kundalini yoga can literally have dmt trips yes. i know f i have friends that have done dmt and have experienced dmt trips through kundalini yeah. but you have to be really dedicated i mean there's a lot of time a lot, yeah. a lot of time a lot of energy and you have to really understand the the, the methods and and follow them to a t and you can achieve these altered states of consciousness that are apparently you know, not from my personal experience, but from what people tell me, incredibly profound. 
Yeah, I mean, I've had comparable things. I guess that what it's, you know, the difference between feeling something that's that overwhelming that gives you no choice. Yes. You know, like there's like, it's not like, you know, Kundalini, you've got to do these breaths correctly. You've got to sit there, you've got to try again. Have and you again. done it? Yeah, I've done a, quite a bit Have of Kundalini. Well, what for me, it feels like what I felt quite a lot yogically and meditatively is a cessation of what I would call my individual consciousness. Like, oh, I'm not this. This isn't who I am. This is just a temporary experience. And all of the value systems of our world are built upon these primal drives in collaboration with a culture that likes to stratify people and manage people and operates like a massive farm where it's easier to keep people together operating in these kind of ways yeah. systemically. I've sort of felt rushes of that, like a certain wordless clarity if you can imagine me having anything that was wordless even for a moment and like and in that space you know there is there is great peace so i suppose get like what's turning me on about the like the dmt and ayahuasca thing is that the way it's narrativized that you're going to meet characters and stuff like that and it's and mm. it's going to be plain and beyond doubt you know because i suppose what prophets do you know like whether it you know when a prophet returns from the whether it's the burning bush or the cave they come back and they say all this stuff that you're taking seriously is not real there's this other realm start prioritizing it or you are going to live in hell on earth you're going to be governed by your materialistic drives your sexual drives and it's going to imprison you and it turns out that they're right yeah. and so like you know i suppose what i'm after because i'm Partly, you know, on a super, like on one level, influenced by what you're doing and how you've created your own, like you create your own business and your own success, like this this symbiosis of stand up and the podcast, and like it's become like a sort of a lifestyle brand in a sense, Joe. Like you know, I'm sort of like, yeah, I don't. I don't want to be continually dragged into these like working within institutions. Like you know, I, I'm over here doing a bloody um, doing ballers, and I'm bloody glad to be over here doing ballers and working with the Rock. And I've got a funny story about that if you want it. Okay. Uh, like, <laughs> like, uh, um, but like, uh, you know, like really, what interests me is like, can I be and can I dedicate my life? to humorously communicating spiritual information and indeed starting to live it. So like, and I suppose what that would mean is, you know, I'm getting better, but I'm not a person who's obsessed with porn or sex or drugs or whatever, like, you know, to become it, to mm -hmm. become what you actually are, to recognize that we're all different. Your perfect realization of you is going to involve hunting and all of these things that you've created through your gift. And that my perfect version of me is going to, you know, involve all of this. And not everyone needs to build sort of empires or entertainment industries or whatever, but all of us are on some journey to self-actualization and realization as individual as our fingerprints and as natural as a seed turning into a tree and if we don't have a way of accessing that no wonder we're dissatisfied no wonder we're t there's an opioid epidemic no wonder people are bored and angry and lonely well i think what you can do is be yourself and what you can do is express yourself and what you can do is constantly seek to improve and grow and you are doing those things so if you're saying can i do these things can i be comedic and spiritual and well you're doing it right so, so it can be there. done so it's don't you're doing it you know it's all just a matter of what whether or not you're satisfied with your progress and where you are and who you are and how you express yourself. So your pursuit for excellence, when you're saying, I've got to get better at BJJ or archery or mm -hmm. hunting or whatever, that isn't coupled with a sort of sense, because you're not fucking good enough. No. See, that's the, that's the, no, the deal that I've got. There's wonderment. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> joy. That's yeah, so there's cool. There's joy in it and there's enthusiasm. I mean, in everything. Mm. And archery in particular, it's very, you know, there's that book Zen and the Art of Archery, which is uh, it's an interesting book. Uh, it's you know, I mean, I think there's some really great points to it. But that state of mind that you get when you release an arrow and that arrow perfectly finds its mark really is Zen. Oh. It's you. It requires so much concentration and focus and technique that you really don't think about other things. Beautiful. And it's cleansing in a lot of ways. It's mind cleansing. I find jujitsu to be very similar in that way too. That it's so all-encompassing it's so there's so much on the line it's so difficult to do that while it's happening you're freeing your mind up i mean i think of video games in the same way all it's of these things suggest yeah, that's bizarre but like yeah. it, all of those things suggest a transmission between the inner and outer world yes. isn't it you're looking at the bullseye and then, oh my God, mm -hmm. I've made this thing traverse time and space. Or BJJ, I've been shown again and again how to execute this triangle, and I've just actually done it against resistance. It's uh, amazing to yeah. feel that. It's amazing yeah. to feel that, that, that your inner life can express itself in the material world, whatever, well, wherever you're looking to explore that. And to test yourself. And when you test yourself and you have to 
figure your way through something or change the path because the path you were on was unsuccessful. When you're doing that, it's it's really good for the mind and for the I, I don't I hesitate to say the spirit because I think that word spirituality is so beaten down and, and abused. You know? What do you mean? It's become it's, commodified. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like when people call themselves a healer. I'm like, are oh, you really? Yeah, I've just done really some healing healer? on the way yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> just healed that guy. We're, we're all healing. <laughs> um, I mean, we we really are all healing each other. But um, I think there's something to doing difficult tasks that it makes life easier. I really believe that. I think it makes life more enjoyable. I think it makes the bright colors brighter. And, and, and it makes the, the dull colors, even them, even the, the, the bad moments. If you have real positive experiences with difficult things that you choose to do on your own, I think it mitigates most of the hassle of life. Yes, I agree with that. That is, again, and I'm not particularly promoting this book because I'd like... Uh I'm all right with however things do. But the point of this mentorship is the idea that someone will exhibit qualities yeah. that you recognize you don't, haven't fully realized in yourself and that you can sort of model them and realize them because latently yeah. you have those qualities. Oh, like Kevin Hart. We were talking about how right. admirable I find his positivity it to made be. It's so, so real. It's unbelievable. On a practical level, I thought yeah. he's, the way he's building his stand up, that guy's mm-hmm. fucking diligent. And the amount yeah. of like, when he talked through his when he talked through his work schedule, you quite you fetishize hard working men i think i've heard you talk about dwayne johnson Mm -hmm. and kevin hart like like you like the idea of men i'm up at those people i'm up at two i'm in the cryo chamber i don't do that though i sleep in (laughs) i can't do you what you do a lot of things that they don't do like i but i also you know unlike uh the rock at least i do stand up i mean kevin does stand up too obviously i don't know if he does it as much or as often as i do but i because i do the clubs i have a philosophy about what's required to develop great stand-up, that you have to do a lot of sets. You have to do a lot of numbers, a lot of different places, different environments. And I found that out the hard way through my best performances and my less good performances, like what was missing and what did I gain? You, like, this, I think, is a sort of an interesting debate. Uh, it, you know, I don't know if it's in stand-up world at large, but it's certainly something I've thought about a lot, is like that as soon as I was able to have an audience that would come and see me, I was like, I'm out. Thank you, God. <laughs> like, you know, like, I'm not putting myself through that shit ever again. Doug Stanhope feels the same way, by the way. Does he? He's one of the best yeah, ever. Yeah, he's amazing. He's yeah. absolutely fantastic. I completely agree. And like, because I, I thought like, because what I feel like is that the comedy club environment warps your material because you've got to appeal to them. And I think you ain't the fucking arbiters of truth. You drunk, crazy <laughs> 2 a.m. motherfuckers. Like, like, so I get like, I perform. I'll, what I'll do is like, and what I'm doing say at the moment is I'll book the UCB like uh, or like places 100, 200 or go Largo or put on events and I'm doing events while I'm in LA because I think oh these people come and they love me <laughs> and they bring me beads and they <laughs> here's some vegan cookies. And oh you gotta come to the comedy <laughs> store man and go on after Joey Diaz. Fuck you! Because <laughs> 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 I feel like I like a nurturing environment again in there. I mean because I've done yeah. that. I've done those fucking clubs mm-hmm. and like you know and even comedy stores and late at night comedy store in LA you right. know as well as London and I feel like oh Jesus thank God I don't have to so like I'm interested to you that's part of that what I think some people could reductively refer to as machismo in you like that you go no I'm going in there I'm- well you know what it is it's that guy that mounted you and went for the arm bar and you escaped right it's worth it because it was hard you like you realize if you, if a child got on top of you and went for an armbar and you escaped, you'd feel nothing. <laughs> so when you're at Largo, you're you're performing for children. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing child stand up. Oh, no. It's like you're wrestling with hundred pound women who just started yesterday. It's like the Make a Wish Foundation. <laughs> Go on, Russell. Then tell us your stories. Yes. Well, if you noticed, amazing. Oh, bravo. You're wonderful. We you've brought you flowers. So well. Thank you, thank yeah. you, children. But but like, look, the counter argument to that yes. is. That therefore I'm in an environment that is sympathetic and mm-hmm. it is my audience sure. and I'm not biasing I what you know the idea of overcoming a greater obstacle I completely appreciate what you're saying but say you believe in the purity of stand up as being some real expression of yourself as in the arrow hitting the bullseye mm-hmm. I feel like I have a vision of what I'm trying to achieve and increasingly it's becoming about I want my stand up I want to hang on you know like as I've always done stories where I feel 
feel embarrassed and humiliated, but I want to hang off it, ruminations on what I believe to be the nature of truth. And I want people to come out of those things feeling loved, validated, accepted, and that they're good enough and that they can explore mm. themselves. You know, that's so it's what, more of a one man show. In a sense, it's that, yeah. but I don't want to like sacrifice the laughs. Do you know what I mean? I love the laughs. The laughs, what is where we're at, you know. That's but you don't given. have to sacrifice in a one man show. I mean, you can certainly do a one man show that'd be really funny. But say you start going into, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And I'm sort of like, I'm trying to build things like around 12 steps and trying mm -hmm. to you know, like doing things that people have some takeaway value yeah. from. Now, like, you know, like trying to develop that after Joey Diaz in the store. It's not going to happen. <laughs> There's going to be some well, resistance. You, are you aware of Hannah Gadsby and the controversy? Yeah, what do you think about that? In the net. I haven't seen it. Yeah, nor, nor I still have I say actually, I'm, I'm going to see it, but because what the end of comedy and all that kind that's, of thing. That's silly. It's no end of comedy, but she, what she's doing, people like, and there's what nothing wrong. Well, I don't know. You call it whatever you want. Sometimes it's funny. I mean, maybe it's stand-up comedy. Some maybe of it's my her mates version watching, of stand-up comedy. They told me towards the end, it like it become a sort of quite aggressive towards the audience. Like, yeah, like, it became like a TED talk almost. I guess apparently. I'm interested. In, you know, that's you know, yeah. There's enough room for everyone to exp yeah. to do whatever they're doing. But like, see, at the beginning of my uh, let's call it career, like I I used to not prepare at all. I was still drinking and using. I'd go up on stage. I'd chop shit up. I'd get into confrontation. Like I, when I say chop shit up, I'd take up animals shit part, animal parts that I'd got from butchers like like a skull with all meat and stuff and sinew on it chop it up fry it, and they would just release locusts get into confrontations and like so yeah exactly the reaction you're having is the reaction they were having <laughs> like so some of the front row would, I had like um, fights I've got scars on my body from bad stand up gigs from a time where I got into a confrontation like I was making a point about pedophilia saying oh we're right. all one cultural mind so when a particular pedophile has transgressed against a child we're all responsible but like what the fuck <laughs> and I, yeah, and like, so that's I a tough yeah, sell I got the shit kicked out well that time you know I've still got the scar on my leg that happened in Edinburgh in Scotland people didn't take it well you know, <laughs> like, like, so, but what I was trying to do was like create I didn't have the skills the chops the experience the mm -hmm. jokes so I was yeah. so under equipped but like what I was trying to do was create environments that felt you know I'm much better at doing that now I can create that kind of an uncertainty in a room a kind of a sense of chaos and what's happening and then bring it back yeah. I hope to a, a humorous conclusion where people feel safe and amused and all of that kind of stuff now I think it's you you can't like because I did try and do that in comedy clubs and yeah it was confrontational it's not what people want so don't you think that by prepping your stand up in those uh, environments that it biases you towards a type of stand up comedy that is, in, is limited no because you can do that other stuff too you could always perform to your crowd and you could always expand on things to your crowd but to really put it together without any fluff <laughs> without any nonsense, yeah. without being self-indulgent, mm. with respecting the attention span of the audience that may or may not even be there to see you. Yeah. Most likely is not if you go to a comedy club and there's a, a large, you know, if you go to the comedy store any night of the week, there's 15 plus people on the marquee or on the, the list and the show starts at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. depending on the night and it goes to 2 o'clock in the morning and, you know, you catch waves in there and there's different types of comedy. And in that, you're, you're going to deal with sometimes tired audiences, sometimes enthusiastic people. It's all different. It varies widely. And I think that um, in doing that, you cut all the nonsense out of your act and you, you develop mm. economy of words. You understand mm. how to captivate people's attention and keep them engaged and to respect their time, respect their point of view, respect that these people have an attention span. They want to be engaged in, in the best possible way that you can do it. And sometimes you develop that through these really difficult sets or, you know, or distracted people and drunks and all that stuff. You can develop that, those qualities. You're always going to have your crowd. And what yeah. your crowd, I mean, if you have this, this vision of how you want to put things together, you can put that kind of thing together at a comedy club. You're doing it in these 15-minute chunks. You just have to figure out a way to grab them and, yes. and make them yes. really interested in what you have to say. You're right, because there's a... Obviously, in like the comedy store between the hours you just just described, there's a contract. We're here, not we ain't here to see you. We're here to mm -hmm. laugh every fifteen seconds. And like you know, comics like 
you know, like Robin Williams or Chappelle's, the, the you know, the all time greats, they went, they go in and accept those conditions. Yeah. And I, you know, you've seen stuff, I'm sure, like of Robin Williams, he's just like walking around in the crowd in that very room. Yeah. Do it's like he's like he's doing the thing I'm talking about, and he's doing it there. Yeah, you know, that's when you think, yeah, if like I suppose I do get that that you're road testing it to a you, its durability to an incredible degree if you can pull it off. There. Yeah, well, think about every time you're saying something. When you're, you have a subject, like say if you want to do, uh, you want to talk about the mentors that you have in life, mm. there's, it's an open-ended approach. You have no idea what the correct way to say something is. You try it. You, ha you write it out. You say, this seems feasible. Let me try it this way. And oftentimes people never correct it or they never, they never adjust it. They never go back and improve it. Mm. They just say it in a certain way and figure out how to do it. When you're doing it in front of a crowd, you're developing these things while also feeling the way people are reacting to them and feeling their attention span. And it makes you, with proper reflection and truly objective listening to your material, it makes you change and shift and adjust things, in a, hopefully in a positive way. Get in, and the more you do mm. it, the more you get a sense of maybe this is clunky here and maybe I figure out a better way to say it and... I you agree, know? but the counter argument could be that it could bias you to a sort of a lowest common denominator area. Say with that bit where you talk about the sun, and you know it's you know it, you need it, it's trying mm -hmm. to kill you, it gives you cancer. Right. You know, like something like uh, what was the journey of that bit of stand-up? Is it like, like for me? It's like oh, I think of a thought, I try and make sure there's a tag so I know where I'm going when yeah. I'm out there. Yeah. And then it's a comparable process to yours. You're trying to your best to get rid of fluff or whatever. Yeah. So can you recall like what it's like? You know, are you night after night going in with new bits of material packaged within th things that you're a little more confident in? Yeah, and I, I put that bit on a special. I, I can do it better now. I know <laughs> a better way to do it. And just, that's part of the problem with doing bits. It's like sometimes you release them on a special and you have a better version of it now. But my point of that was to a perspective enhancer to let people know that bit was about like understand what's happening here you are literally floating in infinity mm. and it's almost never discussed <laughs> you're hurling through forever there's a fireball in the sky it's a million times bigger than earth if you stare at it you'll go blind it's trying to give you cancer and if it's not there you get sad like, yeah. You live in a dream. Like, this is madness. Your life is madness. It's and, beautiful. Yeah, it is. But I wanted, I, there's something about that particular way of, exp see, because I figured out a way to express it short, in short doses, in short bursts. If, you know, if, if you stare at it, it'll go blind. Mm. It's trying to give you cancer. And if it's not there, you get sad. Mm. So in, the, in mm. that short burst, like, it's, you know, like, wow, yeah, that is all, all those things are true. Like, this yes. is crazy. There really is a fireball floating in the sky. And we're just used to it. We <laughs> live because of a floating million times bigger than the earth fireball. And I, I, when you say, if you can say something like that and make someone laugh, you can actually change the way they look at things. You can actually affect, at least, the way they look at things. If you just say something, sometimes it's profound, sometimes it registers, but if you could say something and it forces someone to laugh, even if they disagree with you, if they're laughing, like, I don't even fucking agree with this, but holy shit, this is funny. You put that thought deep into someone's head and I you agree. allow them to think about your thought process and and how your creative process and what you're doing to sort of bring these things out yes i like the way you just describe the architecture of that you've got to basically have these are some facts about the sun that yeah. are irrefutable yeah now here is how that affects the way we look at the world and exposes to us that we're just ignorant we're not awake to reality we can't hold reality in our minds because it's too vast yeah. to handle i like it and i agree with you that, that you know that with laughter comes access to kind of deeper truths and i've heard some uh, therapist in fact say that uh, like that laughter is to shame what grief is to sadness that laughter is helping to expel shame and to process shame that there's something very important about people coming together and laughing together uh, and I, I like to exist comedically in a world where it's like starts from a deeply personal perspective and admissions and acknowledgements of humiliation and shame and vulnerability and travels out to the universal and hopefully archetypal that you can sort of travel between those points with a comedian that i think we both admire bill hicks what i think is 
fascinating is because, like, you know, like if you've loved Bill Hicks for a, a long while, then you discover, man, that guy worked material a lot. You know, like yeah. you go, oh, I watched this interview of him on the Australian TV. He's doing like a bit that I've seen him do, mm-hmm. you know, in multiple incarnations. But I have also seen him do interviews where he's spontaneously talking about gigs terrible yeah. gigs that have gone badly and he is hilarious but it's very interesting to me and perhaps it's because of that background and that practice of doing clubs that Hicks is very much a comedian that's no I'm drilling this fucking thing and yeah. I'm staying with it no he was a writer I mean he he did ad lib and he did he was capable of going on these rants spontaneous rants but he was a writer you know he wrote these things out and he was aiming to have an impact with his commentary Mm. I mean, that was what was was he was doing. It was not just trying to make you laugh. He was aiming to enhance your your perspective on whatever he was talking about. Yeah, and as a it was seems very disciplined yes. as a practitioner of it. Whereas, like, say a Chappelle, it feels like he's just going <laughs> after right. like an hour. Well, you know, he's got a very unique process. Ch- Chappelle does, and he can turn over an hour like no one I've ever seen before. And I was talking to Donnell Wrongs about it recently, who, you know, was on the Chappelle show with him. And he's like, we both agreed, like he's the best ever at turning over a new hour. He could have a new, uh, he could release a Netflix special. And then have a new hour within a couple of weeks. Yeah. It doesn't even make sense. I don't. I don't understand how he's doing it. It must just flood in. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> he's just. He's in a great space. You know. He's in a great mindset to do comedy. You know. If if you pay attention to how you know when when people study, like if you read Outliers, um, and you read how people when people study why people are great at what they do and what makes them exceptional. There's always a variety of factors. And whatever the factors are with Dave, he's got this easygoing personality, this like very carefully carefree way of looking at things. He's also gone through a lot of bullshit in his career with you know the the leaving the Chappelle show and you know the, abandoning fifty million dollars and going to Africa and really understanding what, what his real motivation were. He was caught up in that world where they were trying to change him and commercialize his television show, and he handled it as good as anybody that's ever handled it. Yeah. He, he handled fame and temptation, I think, better than anyone I've ever heard of. He just said, fuck you. <laughs> and he just went away. He went away and then didn't do gigs for years. People don't understand. He would show up and do stand-up places, but he wouldn't book anything. So, like, he wasn't getting paid. He was just, he did stand up. Dave Chappelle did stand up in the park in Seattle. He brought like a little amplifier and a microphone set up and just started doing stand up and people just gathered around. Hmm. And he did this just to sort of get him back in touch with his roots because he used to do a lot of street performing in New York. And I saw him do uh, street performing in Montreal. We did a club and then we came out of the club and Dave, I think Dave was like 18 or 19 at the time, just started doing stand up on the street. And put his hat out and people would put money in his hat. I mean, he was uh, constantly sharpening that sword. And he stopped doing stand-up for a long time in terms of, like, booking gigs. And then after a while, I said, fuck it, I'm going to come back again. And then he started doing these gigantic gigs. And then, of course, he did his two recent uh, Netflix specials were amongst his best work ever. And, mm. you know, and now he's, he's working all the time. He's constantly popping into the comedy store and the comedy cellar and all these different clubs all across the country and constantly doing stand-up. And yeah, no that, social media. He does not, not involved in any of that stuff. Doesn't do anything. Just, to, just performs. Just does his stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. When you, it's like I, I feel that some people have like found their essence and found their path and live it yeah. like and like they you know that the, like they're a yogi or a priest or something. That's right. That he's just got a devotional. This is who I am. I'm not yeah. doing anything that's yeah. not that. And yeah. It, yeah, that's exhibited even in earlier stuff prior to the cri- that the, you know what you would just, you know the crisis of the fifty million walk away thing. Like by then, if he was at eighteen doing them clubs, he was hardened like yeah. he, what that what seemed so loose on stage was something that had been refined that's a person who's comfortable and yeah pivot. he was always good he was good when i first met him when he was like 18 i think he was 18 i was 21 so it was somewhere in that range maybe i was a little older maybe he was uh maybe it was like how old's dave 46 47 i think he's five years younger than me is that correct 46 or 47 45. Mm. Okay, so he's more. So six years. Six years younger than me. So, you know, I was probably 25 and he was probably 18-ish. 25, 26, 18, 17. But he was, um, 
he was so like calm and like he was very like it was you were attracted to listening to him it was like like look at this guy like this guy's like so comfortable in his own skin and so friendly and easygoing and hilarious but who he was then and then who he became is all the work that he put in you know mm -hmm. it's like he had this base of this really you know this curious young very wise person who saw things that other people didn't see in the world and then he just kept going and just kept going and then of course the Chappelle show which is in my opinion the greatest sketch comedy show of all time even though it was only two seasons it's the best ever and then after that I mean he's basically just done stand-up and done it completely outside of this system he's done up some parts in movies and shit like that but for the most part what he's doing is just stand-up mm -hmm. completely outside of the Hollywood system completely free just goes up, you know, just talks some shit, has a couple of drinks, laughs, and 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 it's incredibly compelling. He's found his groove, you know, and that's it's a beautiful thing to watch as a fellow stand-up comedy practitioner when someone he treat, achieves this mastery level, like you know we were talking about, like this Hicks and Gracie of stand-up comedy level, because that's where he's at right now. Yeah, I agree with you. Become who you are. Yeah, isn't it? he's yeah. Bec he's become himself, and he doesn't have things that are getting in the way of that. You know, that's what's really interesting. Like you don't see him. He's like he's not on social media. He's not on anything. Twitter, or Facebook. He's not on any of that shit. He doesn't pay attention to any of it. He's just just being a person just being a person and doing stand-up you know it's uh and he doesn't have to which is unique too you know he doesn't have to promote things they just sell out yeah what an amazing example yeah. what an amazing example mm -hmm. i've got to promote some things oh what do you got <laughs> the book mentors <laughs> Russell Brand's book mentors. I've, re I've really learned some powerful lessons there from the story <laughs> that of uh, the apotheosis of comedy that dave Chappelle's achieved here's these obligations now i'm i'm booked here to promote luminary my podcast has gone oh, behind a play okay. uh, a paywall on a platform called luminary aiming to be the netflix of podcasts meaning yeah. like that you know your model will i imagine triumph further so like from like this week my podcast will be on luminary as part of their premium content it's an app through which you'll get all podcasts but my podcast is like you've got to subscribe is that launch to that now thing. that's launched because i know that, that was, yeah i know that was in the process of being created are you happy with that so far because well, it, it's not launched i don't know oh, right. but you know you know like that you're going to leave listeners behind because mm -hmm. it's gone behind a paywall but i spoke to sort of like sam harris about uh, like what he, sam harris actually gave, told me about it I me spoke, too yeah yeah. Right, right. And I spoke to, like, and what I recognized is because, like, the advertising model works, obviously, in your case. And I thought, wow, like, there, it was like a good deal. It was a good deal. I meant, well, I can carry on doing podcasts for mm -hmm. two, three years. That's, you know, what this, you know, it's, and it's supporting a lot of other content and essentially not yielding any creative control. If people just, if people subscribe, they get the premium content, my stuff. How much? It was like only like five bucks a month, it's right? Like that, yeah. And you get, like, like, Trevor Noah, Lena Dunham, of, mine. How uh, many different podcasts? I don't know. I think like in their premium content, there's like forty or fifty premium pod, like you know, pieces of content. Mm -hmm. So like, for, like, so for me, I thought like you know, it felt like otherwise podcast wouldn't be something that I could continue to do forever. I would every you know, I'd because I do films or tv shows or stand-up or whatever. Right. It felt like a difficult, like you know, it, it, for me, it wasn't an, a viable thing to pay for you know right. like to pay for people to run it to pay for guests to even get to me and all of that kind yeah. of stuff you know no no so do you do ads on your podcast with it i did before but after this right. it's an ad free model like that's and, there's a benefit to that for sure you know and a lot of people choose to go ad free and then they use patreon or something like that for yeah. listener supported stuff sam harris was doing that for a long time but then he they had an issue with Patreon about certain censorship of certain individuals and certain ideological perspectives where they were, you know, leaning towards left wing things and you know being being restrictive towards right wing things and then mm. you know they policing the way people behave outside of Patreon and some people found that objectionable so he left and some other people left like jordan peterson left and ah i've never entered into patreon to, to, into those waters but uh i know burr does it i think burr has like one a week that he does doesn't oh, Bill Burr's yeah really yeah yeah he's astonishing he's one of the best yeah so like uh but like i feel like uh yeah i feel like it's an all right thing to do but even in um 
like just with using things like YouTube and social media and, you know, like Spotify, iTunes or whatever. Like, you know, as we have seen, there's a point where there is sort of censorship is a possibility. Mm -hmm. Like as you discussed on the Jack, like that run of episodes, mate, as I said to you by text, between the Jack Dorsey, the reaction to that, your response to the reaction through Alex Jones and all that important. I thought that was a spate of podcasts that's like, this is where this medium can be. Mm. The Alex Jones podcast, I thought, was the godfather of podcasts. Have you seen the... It was is that, is that hit the I was going to put it out tomorrow. He just gave it to me. So right, like, we'll put we it were, we were watching, right now. We can we watch, watch it right, right now. now. You want to watch it on Yeah, light? we have okay. a guy who's right. hilarious. His name is Pauly Toon. <laughs> and Pauly Toon makes uh, animated clips for us uh, of wicked. the podcast. And he's fantastic. I couldn't and he believe did that. one of the Alex Jones, Eddie Bravo uh, incident. <laughs> They're choking. And, uh, yeah, well, they, well they were, no, not when he's asking him to choke him here. <laughs> I went the flat earth. No, this one. <laughs> it's so, so ridiculous. Here, we'll play it for you. Oh, I don't hear it. What's going on? What's the matter? My audio cut off for some oh, okay. Reason. Back it up for the beginning then. It was an exception. It even looks like I'm. <laughs> here we go. The guy does awesome artwork, too. Hey, listen, we're going to get to this next. And I, I respect you. Hey, I want you guys to yell at each other for three minutes while I go pee. I got to pee, too. Okay. We'll do it in shifts. We'll do it in shifts. I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, you are someone that I could talk to about the flat earth conspiracy. <laughs> you don't believe in flat earth, but you can kind of understand where I'm coming from. What if I finance a research ship and make a documentary? I can't go away for three months. I will pay. What How much money can you raise? <laughs> We're going to need a... Are you guys going to the moon gonna be or in orbit? Okay, you raise the money for a trip <laughs> no, to South... No, there's no America. raise the money. No, no. I got the money. Okay, you got the money. I got the money. Listen, the money. <laughs> Listen I'm, this is the deal. This is the deal. Uh, this is the uh, deal. Go pee. Go pee, man. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do this. We'll send Joe Rogan. Yeah, no, no, we're gonna do this. Joe, I'm gonna send it's someone astronauts. else. You're gonna find the edge of the world. Yeah, big yeah, eyes, yeah. caps, cats that are knocking I'm things gonna off. I'm gonna film the drop off with my iPhone. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> go well, pee, man. Go pee. Don't you have to go? We're gonna send someone else, Alex. Yeah, but we're gonna do anymore. this. Hey, <laughs> you know what? We're I, gonna I do this. I don't, I don't want to be the one that goes. I gotta pee in a minute. I don't want to be the one that goes. Pee in a minute. Let me tell you something right now. Come on. Tell you something right now. <laughs> I came here and I proved they're keeping babies alive and taking their Brilliant. orders. How did you prove that? I, I, they're admitting it. Jamie pulled some no, shit no, up no, on no, Google. No, they admit it now. <laughs> That's they're, YouTube. They're normalizing it. No, the fuck, the governor. Listen, Listen to me. You really think there's people out there campaigning for late-term abortions? You think that shit's real? You the think that shit's real? <laughs> Monday to animation. keep it legal. Who would kill? do that? Are Who would do that? Who would campaign for that? They the most fucking did it, that Bravo. That's the craziest and shit you ever. You can't fucking admit they're fucking <laughs> killing already more kids. So you're telling me it isn't real when they had a fucking vote in the goddamn fucking Senate? Jesus. That's what a conspiracy fuck? theory. I am ready to beat your That's a conspiracy theory. You just... think you're fucking tough? You're about to get it. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> they're killing already born babies. Stop fucking lying. God oh, fucking damn it. Oh. I'm getting pissed now. Don't get pissed. Go no, pee. I mean, okay. you saw the... Dude, it's he going to see it. Alex, 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 we went into a long conversation about I heard that. it. We, we played. I heard it. Okay, you heard it. I heard the whole podcast. Oh, you're <laughs> I'm okay. playing with you. Okay. okay. But okay. imagine my okay. psychosis think is this. What I said. Think Reality okay. is so crazy that I always thought I was so tough. I can't believe he doesn't have to pee anymore. That I, I got to <laughs> piss a little bit. Uh, the, <laughs> point is, the point is, is that, <laughs> the point is, is that, why are we debating whether the earth is flat? Dude, they're keeping, they have human-animal hybrids. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's good stuff. That's what I mean. I feel like that is the pinnacle of where this medium can take us. Yeah. It's watching, like, that's like, he was in an extreme state. What about when he could go, buy be comfortable. I'll keep the buy be comfortable. Yeah. And that was, Creepy. this is, like, I listened to that podcast. Like, I go and run, so I'd listen to this, and I thought, fucking hell, man. Where else are you going to get this content? Where is that going? You know, well, there's no one would state. ever agree to it anywhere else. That's the thing. You'd never get a group of people whose jobs depended upon keeping the show on the air, whether they're producers or executives. They would never agree to that. They'd be like, you can't have that crazy fucker on. You can't have this on. You can't have Eddie Bravo on all the time. He thinks the world is flat. Stop this. <laughs> Stop it. You're traveling between such diverse and unusual ideas. And, and yeah. sort of the thing with Alex Jones is, as well 
is that he's like he, go, he demonstrates to a point that there's veracity in what he's saying. He's Some like, things, yeah, he's right about a lot of things. You know, when we were talking about animal-human hybrids, and we started pulling up these studies where they actually have done studies where they've tried to create animal-human hybrids, non-viable em- animal-human embryos. They're trying to grow human organs in different animals, and there's all sorts of weird scientific shit that we're doing. Imagine what they're doing in China behind walls. Look at this. China's latest cloned monkey experiment is an ethical mess. They use CRISPR to add human genes oh. into monkey genes. And there's like five monkeys. This happened back in January. And I don't Dude, know. Dude, this is a fucking horror movie. This is a horror movie. This is how the horror movie begins. Right? Because right, you think that once, if that's what's being One revealed, the truth is darker. Yes, for sure. For sure, they're trying to create super soldiers. Someone is trying to create some super soldier, some half champ, half human, super intelligent, murderous thing that's powered by remote control. That is not a good objective. No. I don't see a good outcome for this super intelligent, murderous, remote control chimp being. But what if you could send those super intelligent, murderous chimps to go kill ISIS? Now now we've got a reason to start now designing. We've got a Get them out there. Now we need, we, look, we've got a nice contract with uh, this defense contractor, and they're going to. That's how we lubricate the passage to yes. the murderous monkeys is ISIS. That's the function of ISIS in uh, the cultural conversation is to justify yeah. the monkey soldiers. Do you know what one scared me more than anyone that I've ever read? I read about this thing that um, DARPA was putting together. It's a, a robot called the Eater Robot, E-A-T-R Robot. It's a robot that fuels itself on uh, biological matter. So it essentially could eat bodies. So you've got a murderous robot that eats people. The, it's like That's the its fuel. Worst kind of things that human beings could achieve. It's like people are sat around trying to yeah. come up with them. Well, they're the, you know they, they they're responsible for a lot of really crazy innovation in terms of like military stuff. You know, but Boston Dynamics, you know, they're the ones that make those crazy robots, and they work with DARPA, and those are the ones that make those robots that you can't kick over. Right. You know, I mean, that's what you need. One of those that eats people and you send them to the battlefield. <laughs> kick it over. Yeah, no, that's can't. the first thing we established is you can't kick it over. <laughs> I just think that's that's the big fear is that future warfare will be our robots versus their robots. You know, if we're starting to bring about the worst aspects, uh, the, the worst things that a human being can conceive of, let's channel them through into yeah. reality. It, yeah, it does make you fear that the apocalypse is real. I thought it was bad enough when in the malaise of my younger days, I like, uh, thought, oh, wow, imagine if there was a cleaning service where the person would come around and clean dressed scantily. They do uh, that. They do that. Whatever yeah. devious shit you can dream up, someone's trying to turn a buck yeah. off it, and they've taken it to the extent of the non-kickover robot, flesh-eating robots. Yeah, yeah. What it's is this, Jamie? Is this back. a new one? It's a new video today. Oh, God. Watch this. This is so scary. Is this Boston Dynamics? Yeah. There's something very <coughs> eerie about that type of motion. You know, like the way that a, the movement of a snake is deeply coded to be unpleasant when yes. you see it. There's something about you think that movement, you think that ain't good. Enter but it's, the truck it's towing. Wow. Oh, my God. They're pulling a truck? And yeah. it's tiny little tootsies. Those that, they're that strong? They can yeah. pull a truck? Ten little robots. That's a giant-ass truck. I mean, it is also just a husky sled made out of expensive <laughs> robots and a truck. They've sp- spent a lot of time and endeavor to go backwards. I, I guess, kind of, but... To an evil showing, Santa Claus. They're showing how strong these things are. I don't like... I don't like their gait, Joe. <laughs> yeah. That's an unpleasant gait. Yeah, you should be un, you should be uncomfortable with it. Yeah, that's not, I'm not easy at ease with that. Well, that it's not like human. It's horses. not animal, and there's no compassion in it. It's, 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 it's feelingless. But that's what you got to worry about. You've, you've ever seen that episode of Black Mirror where the lady gets chased down by the drones? I've not seen that. What, the one where they're bees? No, there's a woman who's being haunted. She's being hunted uh, by a robot, and it's terrifying. Because of its remorseless lack of humanity and and empathy. Looks just like that. Looks just like those things. Those are real. Charlie Brooker, he's he's plugged into it. That man's got good imagination. He's amazing. He's amazing. That show is fantastic. But these things, what we have to worry about is once artificial intelligence becomes sentient, and you can somehow or another attach it to these objects that move... And they, they run on solar power, 
or they have you know nuclear fuel cells or some crazy shit that allows them to exist for a long period of time. I mean, I would, you, you don't have to worry about them contaminating environments if you plan on killing everybody in the environment. Oh man! And also, there's no means of regulation, is there? Because this, because this is the apex of human endeavor. They're in what? What can govern that? What can regulate it? And like you say, there'll be a Chinese equivalent for any of this stuff. There's nothing that's above it. Going, is this a good idea? Should we pull back? What did he? He, Elon- the, the, he just pulled up a thing that said they're making that now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've got that one I just now. showed you. They're good. A hundred different models of it are going to be available starting production this summer. <sighs> Doesn't say how much they're, they're going to wow. cost. But available for people to buy. Well, it says a hundred different models. It says produce a hundred models. That probably means it'll produce a hundred of them. Mm-hmm. Like a hundred different companies are going to want them. But I bet it's more than that. Yeah. And Depending th- about how much they cost. Sh- yeah, it doesn't say how much it's going to cost. They're going to announce that later. But they showed... Uh, Oh, like a robot arm coming oh, out. Oh, that looks so creepy. Head. Look at that thing. Imagine we have one of those things in the room filming. We should get one. No. No, don't, what if don't it takes give over. One it. day we come here, it's got red eyes. And it's like, fuck you. Fuck you. What, what you've if done it likes to us the earth. We're the first ones to help it. Or don't it try does. and befriend it, Jamie. <laughs> it's going to be listening to us like <laughs> <That's> Alexa. <laughs> That's be, how it begins, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, there's something arachnoid and eerie yes. about that. It's almost like, you know, now tr- 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 see if this tunes into the DMT component of what we've been talking about. It's almost as if we've already experienced this reality. We've already been through the version where those evil insectoid robots take over. So when we see it on the screen, we think, oh no, we're doing that thing. Oh, we're right. doing that thing where we create those things that bring about our destruction. And I believe it's because we've become biased to commerce and a particular type of progress Mm. Uh, but one narrative has succeeded (laughs) because we necessarily had to throw off religion you know at the dawn of the secular age because religion was becoming systems of bias and systems of oppression and what and systems of uh what do i want to say elevating certain types of power and supporting it at least let's go hang on a minute this religion a lot of it seems like bullshit what we've done is we've abandoned the sacred and i think if you abandon the sacred meaning there is more to life than what we can understand. I listened to the Brian Cox episode and I spoke to Brian Cox, the British physicist, uh, astrophysicist on my show as well. And when he talks about, like he said that, you know, we know that there's not some additional component to a human being because we can break down everything that happens when you move an arm, yeah. you know, or whatever. And I feel like we only have limited instruments. We only have limited instruments. There's certain frequencies that we simply cannot read. What else is going on when people are having these transcendent psychedelic experiences? We're accessing elements of consciousness, energies and frequencies that we are not able to access while we're in this state and everything we're achieving and everything we're building we're building on this platform and the bias of this platform is towards progress and materialism and i think the result is fleshy in robots and those evil monkey warrior (laughs) soldiers and we might i want to calm down have a little talk about what it is we're trying to design yeah i don't know if i agree with brian on that particular point that we think we know everything about where consciousness emanates I don't think that's necessary, but I like the fact that he thinks that way because he's such a rigid hardliner for science. And yeah. I mean, the guy works at CERN. I mean, he's a, a brilliant, brilliant man. So, of course, he thinks yeah. that way. I also don't think he's ever had a DMT experience. That's right. I wonder that, yeah, yeah. some people, I think, give him a quick dose, you know, like yeah. because I, I, as well, I respect Brian. And it's further to my point, similar to the hunting argument. I can, be, you know, I happen to believe in God. But like I, when I talked to Brian Cox, I got to the point where I was saying, all right, even though I believe in God and you are an, a, a, an atheist although he said I don't call myself an atheist well I felt like we both got to the point where we said compassion kindness and love are the most important things yeah. so in this way who cares so when how you, say you get you, there when you say you believe in God do you believe in the traditional God of Christianity do you, do you believe in God as a concept do you have your own definition for it that I believe that that state of w- oneness and transcendence that you're talking about when you through your DMT experiences that says you know love and kindness and love and mm-hmm. awareness, I believe that is the most real thing. I think that preceded all matter, and I think that we that we can interact with it. So I don't believe God in a sort of in just a Gaia way that the whole world is like an interactive bio- biological living breathing goddess. I believe that we. I believe yes that and that we can commune with it and i am furthermore the relevance of it for me is that it it suggests to me that we should be acting kindly and lovingly and when we're thinking about how do we organize our systems that our awareness of that energy accessible to all of us should be paramount in our understanding of how we organize so like 
what I think is like that we should look at, you know, like we've been through as human beings, you know, so many advents, the agriculture, technology, industry, thinking that we were, that the, you know, the sun went round the earth, thinking that the earth was flat with all due respect to Eddie Bravo. Like, <laughs> and, and like, you know, and we, and, and before each of these realizations and each of these changes, we always think we're at the summit. We never know what's going to be the thing that's going to change. My suspicion is that what's going to change is that the way we relate to consciousness and the way we see ourselves as individuals that we start to have an understanding that what that that becomes a priority that thing you described of like when i have come back from dmt trips i recognize this is just an illusion and it's not real i think that will start like i believe that we need to prioritize that and progressing along that line what are the implications of this not being the most real frequency there is how do we organize society on that basis how does that affect how we relate to one another what kind of how should we be governing how how does that affect justice that that should be in the mix instead of how many fucking terrifying arachnoid weird gate robot motherfuckers mm. can we cook up <laughs> you know like that's the way we're going the progressive technological yeah. route because it's created medicine because it's saved so many lives because it's given us wonderful technology the spirit of entrepreneurship but all of that energy it all gets m pushed in one direction yeah. you know, it all goes that way and I feel that we need to invite that back the sacred and the divine need to be back in the conversation well there's certainly going to be pros and cons with everything you know, there's definitely pros and cons with the creation of technology. I think of this, I think of human beings as, <clears throat> if you go back to single-celled organisms, they have very little awareness of their environment. And then as it became primitive bugs, you know, as, as, as things evolved, they developed more awareness. But even us in comparison to certain animals, certain animals have heightened senses of smell and survival instincts, but they're also colorblind. Mm. You know, and they, they, they don't see things. They see edge detection. Like, that's one of the things about deer. Um, they see movement. So, like, if you wear camouflage and, you know, your, your pattern is broken up with a grid mm. and then you stay put, they don't see you. Yeah. They just, it, it doesn't, meet, doesn't register to them. They see movement. So we have a far more complex system of recognition than they do in terms of like visually, the way we see things. And I think that whatever skills or whatever senses that we've evolved, I don't think that's it. I don't think that we've reached the pinnacle of it. And I think that as beings become more and more evolved, they'll probably gain more and more senses. And that could be directly related to technology. <clears throat> it's totally possible that what's going on with technologies that we're also developing through external means, a way for us to see the world, a way for us to view, like what they've done with the Large Hadron Collider is like the best example of it, right? What they do with the Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes. You're, you're using technology to gain awareness and to see more things. And that this is the good side of technologies, that it's allowing us to have a far greater understanding of all the variables that surround us that we might not be able to detect with our senses. Yes. And that this is a part of who we are. And then th I think when you're talking about things like psychedelic experiences, that's probably another realm of understanding that we haven't really achieved yet because we're, we're still evolving as, as, a, as a species, as a thing. What I think is interesting is that the continual bias <clears throat> along that technological path is towards profit you know when we see those uh, um, <coughs> machines yeah. the end point is always how do we make how do we maximize profit yeah. there is no like the influence of how do we do what's right that's like a sort of a a person like a sort of a general ethical uh, what do I want to say sort of code is not being introduced there is no regulation right. like a, you know like ultimately you know ultimately people will create the warrior monkeys or the most profitable machines people will because the the counter argument isn't being made no one is like what well, I'm saying no one's making it there's just there's no union of uh you know there's no sort of clear opinion of hang on a minute where could we be going no there is no body or ideology that's able to oppose the relentless march of capitalism i'm not yeah. sort of like a flat out of capitalism is bad here i am promoting a book using an iphone <laughs> or you know what i mean i'm we're all swimming in it right. but what i'm saying is that 
if we acknowledge there are transcendent realms, there there is information, date and data that exists beyond what we're able to receive with our senses, how are we going to incorporate that in the way we organise? Because otherwise, the sort of the magnetism, the pull, the G-force of what's mm. most profitable, what's going to continue to suit the uh, requirements of the powerful, that will always, the bias will always fall in that direction. And it seems like where that's heading is certain kinds of ecological disaster, certain mm. kinds of economic inequality, certain kinds of conflict you know and like when I, one of the simple uh, uh experiments that i apply is you know if we you know if we people say oh what's wrong with the world the world's so fucked all this polarity i sometimes think well who is benefiting from how it is now are there is anyone benefiting are there any groups institutions or individuals for whom this current state is beneficial and if the answer to that question is yes then look at who those institutions are and they are most likely to a degree involved in establishing and maintaining these systems mm. and there are you know institutions and individuals and organizations that this works just fine for but are they just capitalizing on it or are they organizing it and is a normal part of the way human beings operate with this constant desire for innovation constant desire for improvement we always want to push further you know no one's comfortable where they are they will always want to be in a better place and this is almost like it's built into capitalism right i agree <clears throat> that this materialism which is built into capitalism also is what fuels innovation yes. because you want the newest iPhone so they have to design it and build it and make it I agree. and when new things come out like this new robot that apparently you're going to 100 models whatever that means th what that is is this is, is they're going to sell it so there's like it's fueling innovation someone else will come along and compete with Boston Dynamics and then there will be there will be innovation wars if these innovation wars weren't t in place right now our phones would look nothing like the iPhone 10. It just wouldn't. It wouldn't yes. look like the SX. It would look like, who knows what it would look like. But there would be no, no incentive for them to compete against all these Samsung devices and Huawei devices. And all that stuff is fueling this innovation, but it's all being fueled by capitalism. You're quite right that, that, I that innovation is one of the benefits of the maintaining this yeah. system. But it seems to me that we are excluding other factors yeah. like that, that, that recur throughout human cultures we all have an idea of fairness mm -hmm. of justice and yeah i don't want some clunky weird sort of eastern block phone made out of gray <laughs> plastic you know, with only one button on it yeah. like but like I, we have to i suppose examine as a society and as individuals what is important to us now right. where, where i think you know we've talked touched several times upon you know the fact that as an individual you're more likely to bias yourself towards negative information online you know like we do have a degree of individual power and individual responsibility and i feel like if enough people awaken to the possibility of different narratives that that the capitalist idea of innovation and success and, and progress that, that all of these words can be examined what do you mean progress yeah. that assumes a teleology a purpose Purpose, a destination if all time is happening at once if space is infinite like you know that bit of yours of like you know like, to try and fathom for a moment the limitlessness that we're existing within then all these things are constructs this is a construct and it is good to have technology but it's possible to like at points times of crisis such as what it feels like we're at now and although that people have said oh we always feel that every generation thinks that they're the one because they know their own impending death is coming and they now narrativize that yes. into something social and global mm -hmm. well regardless there's got to be a time where we start to introduce different ideas into our systems it seems like there's room for that now because we do live in a, to a, t a truly global culture that there is the possibility for monoliths to introduce new innovation and there is nothing that can oppose it or regulate it we're starting to see this kind of breakdown so i'm interested in f how we can individually prepare ourselves to organize society differently to be able to to overcome pretty superficial differences like oh you go hunting i don't go hunting we ain't who gives a fuck let's start talking about how we can organize the size where people who go hunting or don't go hunting can live peacefully in different yeah. ways not entirely governed by a small cabal you know and i'm sure power is more complex than that that seem to be hugely biasing the direction of this so-called progress I think you answered your own previous questions when you're talking about whether or not you can be spiritual and funny and like, what are you doing? Can you carve that path out for yourself? That what you're doing there by explaining that 
would influence people, would give people a perspective that allows them to say, yeah, like, why are we doing this? And what is the purpose of this? And if enough people hear those words and have that perspective introduced to them, it'll change the way they interact with the world. And that changes the world. It really Mm -hmm. does. And that's one of the more powerful things about discussions. When someone like you says something like that and it resonates with people and they start thinking like, why am I living like this? Like what, if I only have, if I really do only have 50 years to live, why am I living these 50 years in some really unproductive bullshit way that's not satisfying at all? Because I just want a bigger house? Like, what is it? Do I want a, a faster car? Do I want an expensive piece of jewelry? Like, what is, what is the purpose of this path that I'm on now versus a path that I could be on? And what is the real conflict that we all experience between each other? Is it how much of it is due to a lack of communication? How much of it is due to a lack of real listening and understanding? And one of the things I've said about like comments and podcasts and stuff like that, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people get mad, and I've tried to like, thought, think this through, like why some people, some of the response is so negative to things that don't that seem innocuous on the outside. I think it's because it's frustrating when you don't have a say. Yeah, like if two people, like so you, you and I are talking about something. There's probably some guy right now going, "Well, just fucking stop <laughs> with all your spiritual bullshit." Here's what you do: you wake up when your fucking alarm clock goes off. Mm. You never hit snooze. You get out the door. You put your hours in. Eventually, you get better. You take care of your family. Yeah. You act like a fucking man. And there's probably people like that that, yeah. that are they're upset. They, they feel like we're pontificating too much, yes. and this is all just, you know, uh, just mental masturbation you're right in the ways it is but that's part of how you dissolve these things and think these things through i believe they deserve their say as yes. well and that's one of the things that you know of being a person that goes to sort of 12-step support groups is you recognize that everyone's individual experience that is valuable yes so it's not like that and i've got over the idea that you know, that there's some external thing can be imposed and like you know whilst there are like many people that are you know we could say not using their 50 years to maximum effect because they're you know pursuing odd material goals mm-hmm. there are you know many many more people that are n- have never been introduced to the idea of freedom because from the moment they're born they're economically tyrannized yeah. and told that you're only if you are not economically valuable to this system you are not valuable at all and that isn't that's only an idea like you know if you don't you know if you can't become a lawyer or you know a comedian or whatever fuck you well so many of us are trapped in the expectations and values of our parents too that's a real problem with people don't let their children become an individual. You know, they force their children to follow their own rigid ideology don't and they shame them when they don't. I agree with that. But do you not imagine that a de- fair degree of that stuff is unconscious? Do you yeah, not think that you and I degree, for are sure. probably un- unconsciously imposing things on oh, our kids? Oh, 100%. But not with guilt. And I mean, if your kid comes to you and say, Dad, you know, I know you wanted me to be a doctor, but fuck it, I want to play bongos. I just want to be the best bongo player of all time. I bet you'd probably be like, hey, learn the fucking bongos. Yeah. Give me a hug. Yeah. You know, go get those bongos. Get out there. Yeah. Become the best damn bongoer but, but you can. There or are, even mediocre. I don't sure. care. But there are fathers out there be like, the fuck you are. You're going to be mm. a goddamn doctor. Stop being a pussy. And you're going to mm. go back to medical school and you're going to pick up your studies. And we're going to get you a tutor and you're going to perform because we're a Wilson. You're a Wilson <laughs> and our, this Wilson family has been physicians since 1820. Your grandfather. Time immemorial, the Wilsons have been he, physicians. He made people bite down on a leather strap before amnesia and he sawed off legs and he kept those people alive. You want to play bongos, bongos, you little fuck. You know, yeah. yeah, people get mad. But my per- biases towards my kid, like, uh, like sort of, I like when we was back in England, like I was aware of like grandparents or whatever reacting to spiders and stuff, going, "Oh, spiders are scary." Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Don't fucking teach them that spiders are scary." I don't want her to think of things as scary. Tell her like the spiders are cool. They're all right. There's nothing, you know, like. So, and you're aware of familial influence, like that they want the hair to be a certain way, they want them to wear certain things, they want them to, mm-hmm. like, you know, part of the veganism is like, if you make these kids vegan, at least now I know wherever they go, there's going to be so many restrictions on their food. I've not made the kids vegan. They, you Good know, they eat what the hell they want. It's up to them. Yeah, thank you. Where's my gold star? Where's my <laughs> ticker tape parade? Yeah. Um, but like, uh, so, but like, you know, I, but I don't know what, you know, we don't know our own biases. We yeah. don't know what, where we've been institutional. 
internalized you know right, like, i'm hard. not sure because how you know the very nature yeah. of the unconscious is we are not aware of it you know so i suppose in a sense a c c continued open-mindedness and a willingness to change must be part of any dialogue to uh, go into these situations think, Do you know what? i might not actually know what's that's why i'm not when i was 20 if you'd have said about the hunting i'd be like oh no man da, da, da. like now i'm like yeah jesus there's so many ways of seeing the world there's so many ways of looking at what's yeah. natural and what's correct i'm you know what do i know i think with hunting hunting is like many things and that there's no real clean answer there's no yes or no good or bad because you could think there is but then you find circumstances like wild pigs or invasive species like i i go hunting on a place called lanai it's one of the small islands of hawaii mm. there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 people and 20,000 deer. It is so overpopulated with deer mm. and they have to kill them. They kill them every day. They hire snipers. They hire people to kill them. People are slamming in them with their cars. Mm. I mean, they're fucking everywhere and they're access deer. They're not even from there. They're from, uh, someone brought them over from India to give to King Kamehameha in like the 1800s. They're, they're animals actually that evolved to get away from tigers. So there's this insanely fast, beautiful deer that are everywhere. They, they're forced to kill. Well, the good news is the people that are uh, low-income people of the island always have meat. There's, there's meat everywhere. Everyone mm -hmm. can hunt. It's really easy to find them. You can, you can find them, and if you, you know, if you want, you can go kill them. Yeah, I've got no moral judgment about that. You know, if there's rats in my house, what, I'm not going to put down poison? I'm going to go, oh, But that's the thing, rats right? As are a allowed vegan, to flourish. You should probably feel bad about killing a rat, right? As a vegan, I do yeah. feel bad. You feel bad about I feel swat bad mosquitoes? about everything. I'm hungry. What about, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't swat a mosquito. Even, you even the Even the Dalai really? Lama, even the Dalai Lama, Lo, I see him, he went, uh, like, the first time a gentle brush, the second time a harder one, third time smack. The the Dalai wow. Lama, like you know, you, the, the Dalai Lama gives them free chances. <laughs> Joe, can I? <laughs> well, then you're out. You yeah. might be reincarnated or something. Better. Can I go for to a pee, please? Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead, man. Thanks. It's almost three o'clock already. Can you believe so it or not? Quite well. Oh God! I'm like when standing up has made me realize the pressure my bladder was under. <laughs> he's such a character, isn't he? He's got these incredibly long rants, you know. Yeah. But he's so um, self-aware and introspective. He's like always analyzing himself, trying to find if he's doing right. Yeah. I get a kick of these celebrity dudes doing jujitsu too. I think it's hilarious. It's awesome. It's cool. It's cool to hear him talk about it. You could tell, you know, the, the struggles with it. I just saw someone else said they just started it, and I can't remember who it was. Someone famous? Um, yeah, it might not be relevant at all, but I'm trying to. Uh. I think D Demi Lovato is like a purple belt or some shit. She's been into it for a long time. Uh, Russell, who Russell's you know, I've it, trained yeah. with it. Russell's a legit blue belt. I rolled with L Russell, <clears throat> and I was like, wow, Russell really knows jiu-jitsu. He's actually doing the right stuff here. It's hard. It's hard for someone to go from a place of where a guy like Russell Brand is. Handsome, beautiful, famous man who has got some strange plumber sitting on his face, yanking on his arm. <laughs> his description of it is awesome. <laughs> yeah, filled with bowel, feces in his bowels. And yeah, that veganism stuff's for the birds though. Sorry, vegan people. To eat eggs. If you don't want to kill any animals, please just find, find a good farm that has pasture raised eggs and see how much better you feel. Or eat animals that are assholes. You should find animals that are assholes in the woods. Only eat the assholes. Somebody sent me this horrible video that I've seen many times before of uh, a bear uh, killing a deer in a backyard and the deer screaming, the bear's tearing it apart. I'm sure you've seen that before, yeah, right? Yeah, we've played before. And uh, he sent it to me and he goes, okay, now I get it. Like, I didn't think, I thought like if a bear got a deer that it would be just, oh, hey, this is just how nature works. Like, no, this is a horrific, violent act of this animal tearing this other animal apart. Now, would you prefer that than a hunter? Because 99 times out of 100, when a hunter kills an animal, it's way quicker. There, that's the video. It's horrible. It's a horrible video, this animal. I think it's actually a black bear. I think it's either a grizzly or a color phase black bear, but it, t it takes a long time too. If you, if you haven't seen the video, it's a long one. And the animal makes some horrible noises. 
We're talking about uh, Russell Returns. We're talking about uh, a video that I've seen before about this bear that kills this deer in this guy's yard, and the guy films it, and the deer's making these horrible noises. And uh, this guy sent, sent it to me, and he goes, uh, now I get it. He goes, I get what the wild is actually all about. Because you don't really see it that much. You don't really. See, it's very rare that you actually see an animal kill an animal. So we have these romantic, disnified ideas of what the food chain looks like out there. Yeah, nature's brutal. I mean, <sighs> I don't try and impose on my dog the kind of yeah. conditions that I would hold myself to. You yeah. should have an organic garden if you really want to do it right. Because if you're getting into large-scale agriculture, you're buying food from people that grow it, they're running over fucking rabbits and yeah. mice and killing things with pesticides. And there's no there's no removing yourself from death but just by <laughs> eating vegetables. It's just you don't. They have to re... Also, they have to... Like, when with large-scale agriculture, they're, that ground... All those animals get displaced. Yeah. You know, it fucks the whole ecosystem up, of whatever area they're planting on. And then when they roll over it with those gigantic combines and pull up that grain, they're chewing up everything. That's why vultures always circle where combines are. As soon as they have fresh cut, the vultures start showing up because they know there's going to be something that got jacked. See, once you know that, that monoculture is unhealthy, their only resistance to altering it to having like permaculture and mm. healthier better agricultural models is commerce and profit that's the no objective. no 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 you communes which you could have as community gardens yes yes you could but the only re but like if you start if we start saying hey why don't we not have monoculture anymore because it's yeah. uh, unfair and it's unreasonable they go we can't because uh it's profitable to have it and people won't be able to afford food but all of that is like a you know a, a, a an interrelated system that's sort of gridlocked into protecting itself yeah you know like there's a, the, a spiritual maxim wisdom is acting on knowledge and that is not the world we live in we right. know things and then we just ignore it you know like as individuals or as or as you know co corporations and as groups and like what i feel like i'm trying to do as an individual is hold myself to that standard like i know that's not good for me to do that anymore i'm not going to do that i'm going to like oh, i'm going to watch myself and i'm going to watch that behavior and i'm going to try and improve you know like i don't want to go like when my first impulse and heading down to the hibiro jiu-jitsu places i feel nervous i don't feel confident doing it i don't want to go or whether it's like giving up meat or whatever but i'm doing these things in a sense as i think these are the kind of improvements i can make now like when you we almost don't expect that of politics anymore you don't expect a sort of a political figure to say well look, listen monoculture is having a terrible impact they'll make some gestural thing wouldn't they they go look we're going to try and control facebook and google a little bit mm -hmm. we're going to try and reduce emissions this amount now to go listen we know that's wrong we're not going to do that anymore because the, the, there's too many powerful interests that's why i was susceptible to the vegan documentary you know of course there's the ethical reasons in my opinion for becoming vegan but because it's like the reason that these kind of foods are promoted is because these powerful groups lobby government and lobby the the group the organizations that set the standards until they shut up and comply uh, you could sort of say that about vegetable based foods too That's i mean do you think there's like powerful corn. vegan lobbies they still well, seem no no so vegetables. vulnerable no ve vegetables just <laughs> corn just growing right, corn. Right, definitely. The Monoculture, corn, I mean, that's, I agree with you. you know? That's the same, that is the same, you know, like you're saying, that the reason that is continuing is because it's profitable, And but these ideas aren't going to get explored because we're on one path, one teleological journey. Like, that's sometimes what I feel like when people talk about the threats of different cultural influence, e.g. Islam, for example, right? But I feel like, well, we already live in a kind of fundamentalism that's invisible to us because it's all we know. We live in a culture that if something isn't profitable, it will not survive. And I don't think that's how human beings are set up to exist. I have this rather lovely anecdote about like I was coming back from a gig and there was a woman, like she, her car broke down the side of the road. I had a driver. Forgive me, forgive me. I'm not poor anymore. Forgive me. I had a driver and we see this woman. She's by the car side of the road. Her car's broke down and different like... It's a night time and like a few different people stop and help her. The first guy is like, this is in England. It's like a Polish immigrant guy comes and helps. You know, my driver is a Muslim geezer. He's helping. I'm trying to help. Pretty inefficient, may I say, because you know, like if you're a famous person, when you go into a situation, there's sometimes you don't want to be recognized. There's other mm -hmm. times it's quite good to be recognized. When you're not recognized at all, I always think, oh, 
I'm not being at all recognised right. in this situation. No one recognised me in that time. So I was just a weird geezer at the side of the road trying to help someone who had a minor accident without any relevant skills. Then someone stopped with relevant skills. He was like a paramedic. He took control of the situation. He was ordering people around. You stand here. You do this. Go and get that. Go and get my head torch, he said at one point. He had a Whoa. fucking head torch. This guy's serious. And like he res- like he brilliantly resolved the situation. Um what you know, was he doing with the head torch? You, do you mean like a light? He had a head torch. A like light. A to- yeah. Okay, yeah. not a torch, like a light. Yeah, I was right. to think, is he burning? Is yeah. he welding? <laughs> what is he doing? It is didn't emit torch? heat. All right, fair enough. Yeah, this might be a... It didn't emit heat. So it it's didn't a light. emit heat. Right, right, right. I just wanted to clarify. In my country... You British people are so strange. <laughs> Even the way you spell tires. Like, what's that Y doing in there? That's necessary. <laughs> That's the Queen's Y. Why does color have a U in it? You need that you <laughs> to round off the second syllable of colour, you savage yank brutes with your colour, colour. No, it's a diphthong. Colour, colour. Like we the- can't even say snooker. <laughs> we, we say snooker. We can't even pronounce a sport that we don't Birmingham. even play. Ham. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's a. It's we a burn ca- ham. Catastro- catastrophe. The way you How talk. How do we burn ham? Burning. Oh no, burning ham. Oh. Birmingham. <laughs> Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah. Birmingham. That's yeah. right. Listen, this guy had what you would evidently call a headlight, headlight. but even that doesn't sound right. Yeah. It was headlamp. like a a headlamp yeah like that's an odd thing to have in your called. vehicle no 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 I have one what you got a headlamp in your yes. car yes what are you anticipating if you get stuck somewhere man if right. anything happens you should have a headlamp this is the kind of person that you want pulling over well listen when you go hunting <laughs> one of the things that happens is you're in the woods and when it happens when the sun goes down you can't see where the fuck you're going you have to have a headlamp how every hunter much has distance? a headlamp very far what? I have a really good one Honestly. yeah I have a really good one yeah. so you're lighting stuff up isn't that going to alert the... Well, you you don't hunt at night. Right. You know, it's illegal. Once the sun goes down, there's no hunting. You have to be able to see what you're shooting at. No Otherwise, way. you shoot a person. <laughs> so you have these fucking <laughs> sorts of rules. lights on your head are just to help you navigate through the woods and to spot predators. Because, of course, if you're vulnerable, you know, and you see giant eyes ahead that are nine feet off the ground, you're like, oh, okay. fuck, it's a bear. It's Jesus a two-way Christ. street yes. hunting. It's like, oh, oh. hold on, the hunter's become oh, the hunted. Is. Yeah. That happens. I've had experiences where I've ran into predators in the wild, uh, particularly uh, one time in Canada, I ran into a grizzly bear and uh, looking in the eyes. It wasn't even a big one. It was like a six-foot bear. It wasn't huge, but it looks right through you. It looks yeah. right through you. And so when you run into an animal that's killing shit every day and it looks at you, oh, yeah. there's like a demonic look in its eyes. Yeah. It's, I've, me- I've seen black bears before. You don't see that look. A, a grizzly bear, which is you know more predatory, they have a crazy look in their eyes. It's really interesting. I made eye contact with a couple of predators a shark once in a shark cage on uh. like when I was doing that film Sarah Marshall that I've done years ago uh. or went in a shark cage and right and they lower you down and you see a, shake, a shark come towards you it's like it's swimming through time it's like it's come from another era it looks at you with like you think whoa fucking hell and like and I was terrified in that cage and like like Ed Norton was there and Woody Arlson they were on that island as well they were mates with people that were on the movie they got in the water outside of the cage Oh, they're out of their fucking mind. Uh, that's insane, isn't it? The shark was little, and apparently it's not the kind of shark that eats you, but even the eye contact, it learning its fucking teeth, I don't even look at it. And then another thing I looked at once, I was in a tiger sanctuary in India, and I like uh, I didn't like the vehicle I was in. Oh, yeah, this is a, I, should, <laughs> I should have maybe <laughs> stuck with that, actually. <laughs> this ain't comfortable. <sighs> There's a better Jeep over there. So I got out of it to transition, and my mate goes, you want to get in the car now, mate? There's a fucking tiger over there. And there was a tiger, like, only 10 foot away. Just <gasps> this, a mate, well, maybe I'm exaggerating, hold on, a 20 foot maximum. Like, it was near. And the way that that thing looked, I mean, because it's so beautiful yeah. as well, the intensity of being yeah. looked at by that fucking creature. That yeah. was some powerful shit. You don't want eye contact with, with that. I don't want to look at something that's got, like, that you can't negotiate with. That you can't, I feel, like, look at me, even with a jujitsu, like, I've got that little moment where I go, right. hey, come on, this old Russ. Yeah. <laughs> with There's a tiger. No negotiating. He doesn't yeah. care about your mortgage. Yeah, neither does that grizzly bear. Doesn't care. They look through I've you. I've got kids. Yeah, they don't care. No, yeah. It's just, but that's all it's doing all day long is killing things. It's unbelievable because that's as true as everything we yes. reflect on. It just, to us, who but gives a shit about your theories? most people don't know what that is. So their idea of what the wild is, is really based on two things. One, their, their actual love of animals they know, right? <laughs> it's like dogs and cats. So mm. the animals that we know, we, we, we have this connection with them. So we think that they, these are animals. 
They're science projects, man. Those are not animals. Mm. Real animals don't give a fuck about you. Uh. They're, they, they're in, either indifferent to you or they're scared of you or they want to eat you. That's real animals. The relationship that you have with a dog is like a child. Like my dog is more like a child to me than he is like an animal. Yeah. I mean, he's like my little friend that doesn't yeah. get to speak. He doesn't talk, but Perfect. you know. An animal in the wild is a competing organism. They're competing amongst all the various organisms in whatever ecosystem they're in. And either they're at the top or they're, they're somewhere below that. And that's just how it goes. And every deer is looking around because there's cats and the cats are slowly sneaking up on them every fucking day of the week. And if you go in a place where there's deer, you best believe there's going to be mountain lions there because that's how it operates. Right. And when you see that in the wild, it's so rare. It's so rare to be around that. But when you see that in the wild, then you get a deeper understanding of what it means to be an animal. Yes. What's horrific mm. is factory farming. What's perverse and disgusting is the way animals are treated when these, lives, these livestock companies pump these animals in these warehouses and make them stand in their own shit all day and then abuse them and the horrific nature in which they're raised. Yeah, all that should be illegal. Yeah. Ag gag yeah. laws, those laws where whistleblowers get arrested, those should be illegal. Those are immoral. They're letting people know what goes into your food. And those people are being punished for that. All that shit is, cr and they're being punished because it hurts business. Yes. Well, it should fucking hurt business. Yes. You're doing something that we all think is immoral. That's how I feel about it. I don't yes. think there's anything wrong with even if they if if there should be standards in how cows are raised, how chickens are raised. Let them live like actual cows. That's beautiful. And there's a way that they can do that where people like Chris Pratt, yeah, from Guardians, mm. great guy. He has he raises sheep, and he eats them, and he even gives them out to people. He has butchers that take care of it. These sheep are treated like like they're loved, they're not scared of people, and then literally they get walked into this room, they have no idea what's going to happen, a bolt gets put on the top of their head, bang, and the lights go out. Now you could say that should never happen, and those sheep should just live forever. Okay, you, you could, I could understand that argument. Or you could say, boy, if you're going to eat meat, and you're going to eat the meat of an animal that you know how it lived, mm. and there was no horrific moments in its life. It just one day the lights went out. That seems like the best, most ethical way to do it. Maybe even perhaps more ethical than hunting. Yes, because when I'm uh, hunting an animal, um, it's you know it's out there in this this crazy <laughs> state where it's always looking to get eaten. These sheep have no idea they can be eaten. They think that everybody's their buddy, and then one day they die. Yeah, man, I, I agree with that. You know, like, yeah, there's, it's difficult to bring ethics to that. That's clearly, in my view, a matter of opinion. Some people think that's okay. But Some someone people could say that they could turn it around on me and say you could do that same like thought experiment with people. Like, why don't you just eat people? Why like, hey, the person led a perfect life. You put a bolt in the top of their head and bang, shut the lights out, and then they turn into barbecue. Look, uh, yeah, that's a very pronounced and vivid way. But I would say that, in a sense, we're all, like we're being commodified, imprisoned, enclosed. In, like, the very fact that a law has been made to prevent people regulating or revealing the truth around that. Revealing it, yeah. Showing, shows where the true bias of this system is. In a way, I think that one of the cultural jobs this podcast has performed and this is like whether deliberately or not is it demonstrates that the old political lines that we used to comfortably abide within are starting to sort of break down because you know like something like an obvious signifier of a particular type of person i.e i go hunting now we have to accept is coupled with your view that the agricultural industry needs to be regulated and it's disgusting now th there you know there we have complete and total agreement yeah. and we both can see that the way that legislation is set up is biased towards corporate interests commercial mm -hmm. interests and profit yeah. yeah and so for me bloody whether you know chris Pat, pratt having his own sheep i think yeah no problem man what, what that's not i don't need to spend my time worrying about that i'm a little bit like alex jones like with the why are we worrying about flat earth right. if they've got them babies and all of that stuff it's like, right. I feel like why don't we focus on the things that are making a genuine difference to the uh, the way people are living lives yeah you know and it seems to me that the one of the priorities is in a new global landscape that we're living with what are the dominant forces and what are the goals of the dominant forces and 
and how detached are those goals from the lives of what you might say are ordinary people or the majority of people to use a less you know, complex term. And what's probably most horrific about reforming the system is that the people that are going to suffer the most are the people that are the poorest. So like, if you think of like uh, fast food in particular, right, there's a lot of like really poor people that rep- rely on mm. fast food because it's very inexpensive. If you go and you can get a lot of calories for a, a small amount of money, right? But if you go from the fast food restaurant and then you go down the line to factory farming and then somehow or another they eliminate factory farming and they say, no, 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 if you're going to raise animals, you have to have the same sort of standards that we would expect if we knew you, if we were there, we want pastures, we want animals living in the wild. We want, I mean, you know, fenced in, but like living like an, an actual animal. Not this crazy warehouse bullshit you guys are running. Well, that's going to up our operation costs. Well, then that's how it's going to be. So then the beef becomes far more expensive. Now, if the beef becomes far more expensive, then what a fast food, what do the restaurants do? Well, they're going to have to make things more expensive too. So who's going to suffer? The poor people. Who's going to suffer with cheap meat in supermarkets? Poor people that can't afford it. No, but I think that what happens, Joe, is you start to pu- you have started to pull a thread that reveals the, how the fabric of our culture is corrupted because it shouldn't be more expensive. The only reason it's more expensive is because everything is put into a capital-based ideology. We're already, I've heard many times on this show, you discussing universal basic income. This is like the beginning of looking at alternative economic models. And r- there's an argument for saying everyone has the right to a nutritious des- diet. Every- Everyone mm-hmm. has the right to a safe home. You right. know, so like, you know, if we start prioritizing those ideas above these organizations have the right to maximize profit, we go, well, hold on a sec, then maximizing profit, that's getting taken off the table. And then there comes your counter argument about innovation. Well, I would say if innovation slows, no problem, because we've, our, we've decided as a culture to prioritize housing and nutrition for the majority of people. Now, you can start say that starts to, you know, that's, that's kind of socialism. But, and I don't think that that can work on a, on a continental scale. I think you have to, we have to break down centralized systems, yeah. whether those are corporate centralized systems or national I feel that we that the time has gone where there's too much diversity. Like they're not too. There probably always was diversity. People are different. We're influenced by our cultures, our schools, our education, our class, our races, all these factors. And then to expect us all to live in this sort of single bandwidth of this is what America is, or this is what France is, or this is what England is. People are it's too different now. But what you know, there does. It seems like the standards we're adhering to, unconsciously or otherwise, is these groups have the right to make as much money as they can, and to interfere with that. Is is un-American mm. or un-British or whatever it was because, you know, I'm not, this is beyond national ideas, I'm sure. So, you know, for me, that's the, the, you pull that thread, oh, it's the poor that will suffer. Well, then, no, we have to rule out the poor suffer. So, we ha- so what happens? In the end, you start to get into redistribution of resources, managing and regulating the power of the most powerful people. And whenever that conversation starts, it gets shut down because well, they want pr- to conserve even in a capitalist system wouldn't it be more ethical if everybody started from the same starting block well that's what's wrong with the world right what's wrong with the world is some people are in a a they have a terrible hand of cards they've been dealt you know and my point about food is that the people that are going to they're going to suffer the most are the people that rely on the cheap food yes as soon as that cheap food gets pulled away then a lot of those supermarkets in a lot of those um, fast food stores that rely on that factory farm food, you know, they're going to be in a bad situation. Things are going to be much more expensive. And if things are much more, if, it, I mean, if they make animals live like, um, what is that guy's name? Uh, Polyface Farms, uh, Joel S- Salatin. Yeah. He's a fascinating cat. I had him on my uh, podcast before. He's sort of a farm reformist. And what he believes is that these animals should live just like animals. When he has pigs, he puts them in a a fenced area, but he moves the fenced area every day. So, like, the pigs move to a different spot. And so Mm -hmm. they're just constantly foraging and eating acorns. And Mm. uh, But they're... You know, they're living like a pig. They're living in a, a natural... They're not living in some crazy warehouse. Yes. He does same with his chickens. He has this mobile chicken coop, and he moves it from pasture to pasture, and this is how he operates his entire farm. Yes, it seems, again, that a point that's been... We've talked about earlier, that we 
ought to like if we're looking like no one knows what's right so perhaps what we could try and do is replicate what we do naturally and yeah. so so there is an argument that naturally we do hunt there is a an argument that naturally we do eat meat there is we an naturally arg- grow food too though right I mean, there's an argument that like what i was saying like getting into organic gardening if you have your own garden man i mean that is like one of the most karma free things ever if you could figure out a way to have your own compost your own garden and you don't ever have to rely on anybody else for your food, well, then you're not participating in that shit at all. Do you think that the spirit of entrepreneurship could be turned to designing these systems? Do you think the only thing that incentivizes people is maximum profit? I I do too. I think that it is possible that people would sit around and go, how do we organize a society that's fairer and just, that doesn't kill people's individualism or creativity or right to pursue different goals or to be who they are and believe who, you know. But like, I feel like there's so much fog in the air. People don't know what they actually believe in because there's so much powerful cultural influence, so much toxin, physical toxin, literal toxins and toxicity, cultural toxicity you know how are how am i to uh, protect my children from cultural influences that are telling yeah. them you have to look this way be this way behave that way these are the things that are cool if you're not this you're not a man if you're not this you're not a woman you know like w- w- like you know as a parent i feel the obligation to create an environment where they can grow up to be who they are in inverted mm-hmm. commas and then when you sort of scale that up to a society you know how can we start to recognize Look, is this time to look at different systems for living? And I, what I feel is people want to be involved in the, in the power systems that affect them. Like if you have a group of 100 people, they want to be, be able to run their own schools, run their own care systems, run, be in charge of their own lives, not just be some little beam of energy flicked about by cultural forces that they can't reach or touch. It's alienating. And like one of the things in Marxism, and, that, you know, and I know very little about this subject, is he says that when capitalism reaches a certain point, people will be lost, alienated. They'll feel like a cog in a machine. No one will have no pride in their work. No one will know what it's like to make a whole bicycle and think, look, I made that. You're just, you're the guy that makes the pedals. Now, fuck off home. Mm. You know, now like, you know, like I listened to enough Jordan Peterson to understand that there are limitations to what, socialism and marxism can achieve but just because you know capitalism is better than feudalism that doesn't mean that's the end of the conversation that we shouldn't be looking for fairer better more just ways of living well um yeah i don't know if capitalism is the problem but maybe it's how people engage with capitalism maybe it's what people choose to focus on if you're just about acquiring wealth and money some people are yeah they're going to be very deeply unhappy and it's going to be this weird game of acquiring influence and power till you just have this insurmountable mound of money that you live on top of right i don't think that's a a good way for them either i think if we're going to really we're going to look at this country fairly we have to look at think of all the poor neighborhoods and imagine being born in those poor neighborhoods and imagine being born in a place where there's no resources, there's no hell. You're living in the fucking mountains of West Virginia, those coal mining communities, or people are, it's all just mobile homes and pills and it's chaos and just extreme poverty. What do you do if you're stuck in there? What if, you, if you're born into that clan? That's the group you're born into. You're fucked, man. You're fucked. We have to take our resources and concentrate on parts of America the same way we concentrate on many other problem spots in the world and look at them as like, hey man, there's a spot where people are fucked. Mm. We should unfuck them. We should figure out a way to go into every single horrible community in this country, on this planet. Ones that are just as bad as some that you see in third world countries, they exist right here in America. Fix that. Don't ignore that. That's crazy. If they're in Detroit, if they're in wherever the fuck they are, whatever whatever the horrible community is, why isn't there a concerted national effort to eliminate that? That's a major source of crime. It's a major source of problem. People feel like they got fucked over in life, so they want to get at you and take from you because you got that easy road. But hey, man, you're born in the fucking suburbs. Hey, man, your mom and dad are still together. You know, hey, man, your, your dad has a job and your mom's at home baking and shit. You live like a motherfucking Norman Rockwell movie. Fuck you, man. My mom's on crack. My mom's a prostitute. My life is hell. My dad beats me. I've been sexually molested since I was a little kid. This is the reality that people yes. exist in. They don't feel like anybody's coming to help them. We, we need to concentrate on that. The government, if the government really cares about us, if they're really involved in social engineering and making America better again, make those places better. 
those are the pr- places you need to concentrate on, not tax breaks for fucking super rich corporations that get you in place. They they make enough money, man. That's not the problem. The money is where where the money goes. What's it being allocated towards? The biggest problem in our country is these in impossible to escape communities yes. that, that so many people just get sucked into this trap and for every person that gets out and becomes a basketball player or a successful business person and, and they have this story about the poverty that they grew up in they they are so rare yes and, and then it's not to be applauded that they got through that it is but it's more to be we should understand like hey we've got a real fucking problem that we're churning out all these people that live with, with they, they start out in life with a massive deficit start out in life a Emotionally fucked, physically abused. They start out with everybody around them's a loser. Everybody's going to jail. Everybody is uh, constantly doing pills or this or that. The, it's all negative. And to, to, to ask them to develop their own positive mindset uniquely in a vacuum is preposterous. Yes. So all these pull them up by your bootstraps. All those assholes. Hey, you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, they don't even have boots, man. You don't understand. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. You, you've never seen it. You've never been involved in that kind of poverty. It's yes. not fair. It's no. not fair at all. And if we care about people, that's what we should fucking care about. Yes, I couldn't agree more. That's the number really one problem. Put. And it's everywhere in the world. All the, all the crime and poverty. Imagine if everyone, the lowest you could live is like a middle class existence. Yes. Boy, everybody would all be a lot more fucking relaxed. <laughs> Immediately, if you always had meals, you always had food, you always had a roof over your head. Everyone lives middle class. Holy shit! I mean, mm. obviously, that's way past the expectations that we have right now for the world because, like, thirty-four thousand dollars a year globally puts you in the world one percent. You know, mm. I mean, that's the if you make thirty-four thousand dollars a year, which is hard to live on, man. Yes, that you you're in the one percent of the world. But that standard that you've so very eloquently described is. I think achievable and yeah. that ought be the aim. And when you give just one example of how legislate the bias of legislation is continually to support the powerful while making yeah. the just making nominal gestures to yes. poverty. Oh, Good gonna, way of putting it. Yeah. Nominal gestures. I like how you put that. Yeah. And like, like so the, 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 the if there is a point to nation, if there is a point to a flag and our belief and this idea that there is an America and there is a Britain and we're all together and we're all one and we've got a common destiny and a common past, then if we're not, if we're ignoring and neglecting those communities, then I say that is what defines us, you know, and until there are systems, codes, regulations that prioritize that, we will continue to live in something heading to, if not a dystopia, something moving in the direction of dystopia, where the priorities and uh, dreams are sort of owned really by the kind of Bit mad, evil insect robot images that we've well, seen discussed. Earlier. People do get very concerned when someone reaches a point of excessive power and influence, like a Jeff Bezos type character. When you see some guy who's not, he doesn't have a million dollars. Like, you know, wow, guy's got a million dollars. Like, he must be so relaxed. He's got so much money. No, he's got a hundred and fifty billion. And he works every day maniacally and he's constantly doing new projects and new things and buying out Whole Foods and that's like pinnacle capitalism is one of the things that scares people the most when someone just acquires just insane position of power and wealth yes. like like a Bill Gates type character yes. who is very altruistic, very, very generous. Bill Gates is... He was like one of the better examples of someone who gains a lot of money and then does a lot to help people, especially in his retirement. All all they do is focus on charitable organizations and yeah, which is brilliant. But yeah. like, like, and um, you know, marvelous. And you know, I'm not, not criticizing the great achievements of brilliant people, but uh, like, it, but it really for me that demonstrates the lim- that the limitations come from the type of systems we live in. Yeah. That you can't through charity affect every impoverished community in America. You know, like we. The systems that we have are, oh, well, if you're poor like that, you know, the bootstrap model, well, this guy did it. Look at this great yeah. guy who overcame the odds. You know, until, like, I feel like, in a sense, charity has become a kind of valve that allows, uh, you know, people like you and I who aren't poor to feel like, well, I do a bit, you know, I'm sort of involved. I can wash my hands of it. Yeah. When, you know, like, what these, unless we... There's, there is no America, there is no England unless we have integral relationships with one another right. where we support one another. We're Otherwise all on a just, team. Right. If we really are on a team and we see someone who's completely downtrodden who's on our team and we ignore them, well, that's not much of a fucking team, is it? No. I mean, that's what I feel like when I come to red lights and I see homeless people. I, I feel terrible. 
I'm like, I feel like, you know, I mean, there's part of you is like, don't give them any money because you know they're going to just buy drugs. Yeah. You know, let them figure it out. But then they're not going to figure it out. They have mental health issues. And no, they're yeah, stuck out right. here. And they're supposedly on the team. They probably were born in America. They probably have national citizenship here. You know, they this is our team. And no one gives a fuck that they're camped out under the bridge. It's like it, the the diffusion of responsibility that comes with these massive numbers. 20 million in L.A., 300 and plus, whatever it is now. What is it, like 320? In America? Yeah, it's unbelievable. I think there's 90,000 in the general California, like a city's worth of yeah. homeless people. Isn't it? It's not yeah. difficult for me to envisage. Like when we talk about the transcendent states that can be achieved through meditation and psychedelics, meaning that beings like us can access them, it's not difficult to envisage hum like a type of creature, a type of being a little more evolved than us that would look back and say, oh my God, they allowed homelessness. They yeah. allowed those impoverished communities. Oh, why yeah. was it? Oh, because they had this belief in competitive systems and survival of the fittest that were resourced from ideas that weren't really meant to be translated into that. When you were talking before about like the natural world is fraught with competition and threat, of course it is. That is animal. So, you know, I'm not disputing what you're saying there, but we can't transpose that into an economic system. Survival of the fittest, if you ain't got enough hustle and muscle, fuck you, you're, you're down by the wayside. You know, here we have an obligation to aspire to the better parts of our nature, not to continually use materialism and rationalism to justify that 20% of the population population of you know or whatever percentage it is are just garbage or just waste and they're that's affordable we can accord we can yeah. live with that it's for me it's that's why would we once we have the knowledge that oh yeah we shouldn't be farming in that way oh we shouldn't have social systems all of the the answer is always the same because if you were to change in that area it will affect the interests of the powerful it will affect impede the ability of certain organizations to make profit now i'm you know i'm not talking about you know i don't know the lexicon enough around socialism and capitalism and marxism and various forms of social organization i'm just talking about my assumption that we're all resourced from the same basic material and phenomena we all have compassion and love in us and if we on an individual level can achieve some level of access to that then we can start to organize ourselves on that basis not on the basis of well what's the most i can get as an individual it's rational for me to i'm not involved in that that doesn't affect me personally you know mm. and i think it's a hard thing for us to hold i think the reason we all do just live with homelessness and the only decision we make is do we put a couple of dollars out the window at the light or not then like it's hard to hold that it's hard well, it's to love more than 100 people or there's whatever. no fix like there's no not as an individual but not as not one person and even collectively as a group when you have mental health issues unless you want to institutionalize those people yeah but then who here's the thing right if everyone has a unique and uh, if everyone has their own ideas about what to do with their life and everyone has freedom, what if you just don't have enough people that are interested in, in mental health of the homeless people? You just don't have enough. There's no I resources. Guaranteed. The, the resources, yeah, that's a big question because our systems are biased in a particular what direction. If money? What if they have g g government funding? Do you think that they could cure homelessness? One of the advantages I've got of being a drug addict is it means I have to help other drug addicts as part of my own recovery. This puts me into areas, institutions, groups, facilities where I'm meeting drug addicts and always what you'll find the people that work there there's always someone like a man or a woman most often in my personal experience is a woman some matriarchal woman full of mother energy that just will do this shit forever for free for nothing that just loves it that's just put herself like my grandmother did or my mother did or like these women do between people in the gutter that mm -hmm. are just willing to say I'll be the person I'll yeah. be the person in LA at Friendly House it was a woman called Peggy Albrecht that used to run a play uh, Friendly House was for women that have got drug and addiction and abuse issues and like this woman she was from chicago she was 90 years old by the time like i met her. she was so rude and brilliant and beautiful and entirely willing to dedicate herself and i think every community everywhere everyone knows people like that and i feel like the same way as like if it is someone that's got a great capacity to play basketball or be a comic like i think that when you spot those people mm. that you encourage them yeah, they're talented and talented at helping them. people yeah, yeah the talent of compassion and yeah. like, you know but, but we don't value that unless it's like unless it can be turned to a profit fuck off all of those organizations like those uh, organizations that help people with addiction issues you know like they are maligned and like the, the people that profit from the opioid crisis they are supported they are able to conceal as john oliver brilliantly revealed although they're able to conceal their practices continually the the invisible bias is in the direction of profit and like the failure of 
certain types of socialism doesn't mean that's the end of the argument. I think we have an obligation to look for ways of accessing our own uh, higher nature, better nature, kinder nature, call it what you will, and seeing how we can organise that. Now, as an individual, you can do so much. I mean, if, if Bill Gates can, you know, fucking hell, I don't know, cure malaria and make the significant charitable thing, you know, these impressive, powerful people can't make a meaningful difference, then clearly this is a systemic problem. Well, there's also the problem with homeless people in that they're adults. Um, when you become an adult and you develop from the time you're a child, it's probably very likely that the damage was all done while they were young. They were probably abused and mm. neglected, and there's a lot of issues that led them to either have mental health problems or they had mental health problems already. Maybe they have genetic problems. Then on top of that, there's drug abuse. To, you, for each one of those people to get well, you're going to need a massive amount of folks. You're not going to have one old lady who's rude, who's fun <laughs> and brilliant. That's a cute movie. No, but that's and, 20 you know, people. Maybe, but I think there's a no, yeah, it's a good movie. Yeah, write that good, down. Write it down. I could yeah. be rich. Yeah, who who would be the woman? Who's um, the player? Uh, Faye Dunaway now, or some shit? I would have liked the one that was uh, out of Golden Girls, Estelle Getty. She's oh, still available? I don't Oh God! That's a wrap. Betty White's still around. Betty White's still hanging in there. Yeah, but would you book a movie around her stink hanging around? I don't know that this is going to work. Ago, yeah. How yeah. are we going to fund this? Yeah, it's um. <laughs> no, you're right. Look, there's limitations to the individual, but let's not like crash this optimism in the crib now, Joe. Because I no, feel no, like if there no, was systemic change, I'm not change. crashing the optimism, but I'm saying the logistics of it would almost be insurmountable and it's very hard to But what we refer to, to logistics you... is not an objective thing. It's a thing that's been biased over time. Sort of. Once a person is developed, once they're a human, it's very difficult to turn that train around. Yeah, if we can save the community and save the future, like help like less people get through fucked, help let help more people get through with hope and with a real possibility for improving their life versus have this sense of hopelessness that many are confronted with. That's going to make less crime I agree that's like that's just if they, if someone looked at it from a social engineering standpoint it almost seems like the, the only way that would ever have to happen would be there's be some fucking catastrophe that forced people to act like we sometimes need something that's shoved in our face to force us to act but if someone brilliantly calculated the amount of resources that it would require and then also brilliantly calculated how much less crime we would have, how much less, how many more innovations because people didn't waste their lives. In fact, they got through life and used one of the most valuable resources we have, which is the human imagination and creativity and ingenuity. Like, And we're missing that on these people that are growing up in these horrible environments where they can't escape. They're so fucked from, they're in gangs, they're, you know, the crime and poverty and violence they're so fucked that whatever genius they have is wasted on this nonsensical existence. If they could just show that and quantify how much that would be, how valuable that would be to the overall culture and community of the of the continent and then ultimately of the earth, I mean, there, you would have a reason to engineer and think about this. Yeah, it's a beautiful, that is really beautiful. And it's interesting that the way that I agree with you, that it almost has to at some point be translated into monetary yes. value because otherwise people and don't safety. seem to read it. Yeah, and safety for everybody, for them who live in these homes horrible communities wouldn't it be great again if everybody lived like a middle class person the idea that that's impossible seems so insane it almost seems like well then nobody should live like that then like either everybody should be able to live like that or nobody should be able to live like that that was like that's what everybody really wants right you want to be comfortable like right? in, in terms of like your ability to exist and then all the things you're doing that you struggle with should be a good percentage of them other than emotional and friendship type things should be of your own choosing you choose to, to take a difficult path. You, sh you choose to take an adventure. You choose to try to enrich yourself with this difficult experience and the challenge of it and try to overcome that challenge. Instead of you, your challenge is not to get killed by a gang. You know, your, your challenge is not get fucked by your uncle again. You know what I mean? I mean, this is what people have to deal with. And you're, you're missing these brilliant minds. They don't get this chance to come through and, and sneak through that fucking salmon ladder, you know, get up to the top. This is very uh, beautiful that you're uh, passionate about this. And I think popularizing these ideas 
is important because I feel that then people will be familiar with this kind of language and will recognise that when there is political discourse, how fatic and empty it is yeah. that people will say, you know, like I think in the last election in your country, it was clear that there was no one no one is saying that no one no one is standing on a political platform of do you know what everyone should basically be able to live a middle class uh, lifestyle there's no reason there's enough resources we can do this we could organize society on that basis because that's considered outlandish and yeah. crazy and we're so there's so much i can again you know with your well, um, imaginary listener that a listener that would consider this pontification you know there's so much anger i can I feel that a lot of political events that have occurred in the last five years are the manifestation of a social rage of people that are pissed off with not being heard, mm -hmm. are pissed off with a cultural conversation that didn't include them uh, and that they feel angry. Like, I don't want to help other people. Fuck those. But, you know, like that that resource is becoming sort of nurtured and grown. And it, I feel people would feel tremendous relief to let go of that, to, yeah. to feel like, listen, it's all right for you to be you. Could we be a little more aspirational and a, a little and consider what our goals are? consider what progress looks like to yeah. us is progress the terrifying robots or is progress considering elevating the lowest among us to raise the standard if people could just understand that this this is not forever you don't there is no such thing as forever this is a temporary thing ah. and you've got to try to eke as much good out of this as you can and to go against my point you know there's a real problem with people being lazy People are lazy. There's not an equality of effort. The, uh, the idea of equality of outcome, like people want you know, income equality, well, there's no effort equality. That's just a fact. There's people out there that are just, they work harder, they're smarter, they're more focused, they're less distracted, they're more dedicated, they have a better plan. They've mm, thought it through better and they become more successful. And the idea that they become more successful than you because somehow or another there's some nefarious actions afoot, well, that, that negates another possibility, which is you're a lazy cunt. That's a possibility. Yes. And what uh, do we do about those people? I tell you this, I've got a plan for the lazy. What the, do we do? Lazy uh, Island? You're all Ship going to lazy. Off. It's a bit like Pinocchio's Donkey Land. <laughs> <laughs> no arcade games, though. They're too lazy. I feel like, um, well, I consider this, that people that don't have a lot of life force, like... I feel like it's a gift to be a person that's got a lot of drive to be yes. a person that's like I'm fucking going to achieve this shit you know like some people are mm -hmm. a little lethargic and don't have a lot of energy I feel that's a kind of despondency we could break that down in a thousand different ways is it poor diet is it poor role models is it poor social conditioning who are these lazy people weak genes could be weak genes could be too. even weak genes so yeah. then we're like in the territory of disability so however right. you look at it I think you end up at a point of compassion I think you. I think we should start at the point of compassion because other words, like, what is tolerance if it isn't the tolerance of people that we sort of can't understand? As you know? long as they carry their own weight, we usually don't have a problem with it. But when they're so lazy, they just juke the system and screw people over and figure their way to scam through life. Yeah, but I think those people don't exist only at the bottom of the social ladder. I think they exist at the top and the effect there is worse. Like Are you talking that... about the President of the United States? <laughs> this is my country, motherfucker. You better be a little bit more I polite. I actually met your President and <laughs> I you? found him to be delightful. Yeah, that's really? the sort of thing. Yeah, he was sort of very sort of sweet. Again, like I say, I don't judge you people on the... I interviewed him about five years ago. I was doing... Oh, was... before, before he was the President. before he was the President. He was okay back let then. me near him. He's President, is he? I wouldn't be able to get over the fence <laughs> or let alone the wall and like like he um yeah he was sort of sweet but i remember thinking what i felt was why you don't have no intellectual curiosity he that's doesn't? what i felt well that's what i felt i felt like he, i was sort of liked him he was nice and his staff at that big tower they all loved him but well, I thought, maybe you don't think have about much curiosity way. and i don't think he's been very genuine with that great make america great again do you i don't like he's where's that everyone should be middle class we're going to start reorganizing society reaching out into detroit and into crushed mining towns in west virginia where's that other than otherwise you ain't making america great again that's true that's true but but think about how we were talking about Dave Chappelle, about one of the reasons why he's so great, other than the fact that he's smart mm. and just talented mm. and all these good things. 
is that he knows what he does and he does it. Right. That's his wheelhouse. He stays in there. Trump's wheelhouse is making giant gold buildings with his name on them <laughs> and spray tan. He knows what the fuck to do and he knows how to make money. And yeah. he doesn't give a fuck about all that other stuff because that other stuff is wasted energy for him. His energy is in focusing on how you get more buildings with those giant gold Trump letters on it. And no one can argue that it's been a tremendous success. Yeah, I once stayed in worked. one of those hotels. The water bottle had his face on it. You know what I mean? He's Amazing. Like, incredible. <laughs> <laughs> what an achievement. Like, I was drinking <sighs> the inside of his face. But that's his thing, right? It's like, why is it okay for your thing to be tennis? And that's all you know about. I don't even pay attention to the politics. Why is that okay? But when we see a guy like him, we have a problem with it because he's not. his intellectual curiosity is only about money. So yeah. it's even grosser. I, I agree. Listen, this, you know, where I, the, to return to my point, I w wouldn't waste time judging anyone as, as an individual because I imagine if I were to spend time examining Donald Trump's past, his relationship with his father, the conditions he grew up in, yeah. what he felt he had to do to be a good person, I would imagine I'd go, yeah, of course. But what I would query <laughs> is a system that elevates elevates the people like that and I you know the two he positions of it. incredible power yeah. like and you know again I believe that it's systems that need to change not individuals and I think we've overly fetishized politics I don't live in this country so I don't know if it's much worse under Trump I've heard some things that sound really bad than it was under Barack Obama but what my more my general belief is you don't fetishize individuals and get distracted think about changing the system because you're not getting that middle class lifestyle for everyone Neither, no one's offering that. Bernie right. Sanders isn't offering that. No one's offering that. And unless someone's offering that, what's the where? Why should we get involved? Have you ever talked to economists about like what is the problem? What's the like people that are you know more socialistic minded? They'd be more socialist minded, I guess. But but understanding of capitalism to the point where they could point out the flaws in allowing this infinite growth model where someone gets to a point like a Jeff Bezos or something like that. What would they do to mitigate that? You're not going to put a cap. Like let's when people say that like you're gonna pay seventy percent in taxes over ten million dollars, I was like one of the ones that was banded about. People just start laughing like you're out of your fucking mind. No one's gonna do that. They'll get to ten million dollars and then they'll stop. Yeah, it, like, it's it, stupid. It's that's I think a, a very limiting system, and I feel that the problems are broader than that. I think that the like did you ever sit like you know if you ever watch Steve Bannon talk that he's a man like you know someone I would again not politically agree with for what it's worth, but when his description of what happened in that economic crash of 2008 mm -hmm. and the decisions that were made for the you know American taxpayer to bail out the like financial industry and I've since subsequently seen a documentary that said look this is why we had to do that these were the options but like for me that is a demonstration of capitalism's inherent failings and limitations that we're not talking about a system that is flawless and perfect it's pretty fucking flawed aside from the human collateral damage and that you have again described the, the the communities that are impoverished and without hope and living in poverty in a kind of slavery you know it even in itself doesn't work according to its own rules it has to be artificially sustained and rebooted when it inevitably fails well so, the pure sign of it is that the fact that no one went to jail for the subprime mortgage crisis yeah. Those guys didn't go to jail. All those guys that the, with the real financial analysts were looking at it from a distance. They were going, I see where this is going. Like, this is going to blow up and a lot of people are going to lose their houses. Like, you guys are assholes. Like, yeah. then, and there was a lot of people that engaged in those predatory loans and they didn't get punished. Those, those guys, the craziest thing is a lot of them got bonuses. Yes, that's right. They got bonuses even if the bank got bailed out and they said the bonuses are part of their contracts and if they didn't honor their contracts, they'd have a hard time hiring these people and there would be chaos. And they, they just made it a reason why they had to give them millions of dollars in bonuses Yeah, to, when they failed. Like so, you get a bonus and you failed? Like your bank failed and you still get a bonus? Like you knew about those predatory loans? You knew about those? You knew about the subprime mortgage bullshit that was going down in your business, yes. and you just let it ride. And now you're gonna get a you're gonna get a bonus. What's the bonus for? <laughs> Wait, yeah, what would you have to do to be fined if that's yeah that's the bonus? <laughs> what system? would you have to do to be jailed? Yeah, I mean, just think about what they're doing to Julian Assange, right? They're they're they're, they're throwing that guy in a jail somewhere. Yeah, that didn't look good. That embassy move. No, but I mean, the fact that what he did was release information that everybody found very interesting. 
and what they did is crash the whole fucking economy. Right. You it's know? pretty good that he was able to ride that embassy idea for as long as he... Because it's not actually in another Seven country, years, is man. it? It's in no, London. I know where it London. is. I went and visited him in there, yeah. as a matter of fact. Just briefly popped in, saw him. What do you think's going to happen with him? Well, I think he's going to end up serving a pretty lumpy prison sentence somewhere, isn't he? For, what do you think they're going to get him on, though? Like, what are they going to charge him on? They're charging him on, like, hacking charges or some shit now, which they didn't charge him on before. Right. Is that what's emerged? And he's going to be extradited to this country. Is that true? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, again, I suppose this is what happens if you challenge the interests of the powerful. If, if Trump was really, if Trump really wanted to get people on his side, he'd pardon them. Do you think that that would be popular? Because like someone like that, Edward Snowden, is it like, look, I'm sort of, obviously, I think don't put the lives of people at risk that are in compromised military positions. That seems like a fairly obvious thing. But like, I don't think they did that. But though. No, it doesn't from what seem I understood was they got hacked and someone else released the the documents without the names redacted. Yeah, it seems to me the that... WikiLeaks never did that. Edward Ed Snowden it seems to qualify for a hero in pretty yeah. much any way you look at it. He's like a 26-year-old person making that decision. Yeah. And, yeah. and very brilliant. You know, I've heard him... Uh, I think he was on Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast. Where they talked to him oh, via, wow. via Skype or however they did it. But Did you see in Citizen 4, there's a bit... like In that film about Edward Snowden, Citizen 4, there's a bit where he's just come out and he's talking to the journalists or filmmakers that are making the film and he's going, they can fucking watch you with this phone. You can't leave that like every, he's yeah. like in the sort of a state of mad enlightenment where he's just yeah. seen the truth of they're listening to us now you can't fucking have that on you got like, like yeah. it's terrifying to watch someone because you know obviously now he's calmed down he's dealt with it he understands that you know but he was like a person that was emerging from having seen the other side of the matrix yeah i mean i mean he was deep into it and then when he revealed all the information they had a fucking they were had a manhunt for him the guy had to hide out in russia he had to seek asylum in our enemy yes it's, it's, the whole thing is so strange yeah so who do our power structures actually support if someone tells the truth to the population they have to flee to russia yeah. if someone t talks about improper agricultural practices that's against the law they can be in prison that it starts to reveal that the state itself the very thing that we revere the very thing that we identify is the tool of our oppression they want to discourage people from leaking in information that makes them look horrible it's that simple yeah it's just it's that simple if you look at what information he leaked and what it, what it did well it you know it, what he did was he revealed things that everyone wanted to know about yes. that we felt were crimes it makes me feel that it's as simple as if you knew what we do in order to keep shit running you would revolt so we are never going to let you yeah. know. Well, that, for me, in a sense, is a pass to stuffing. Well, hold on a fucking well, hell. who are you? I thought you are elected officials. You're one of us. But no, you're above us to the point where if someone leaks information about your crimes, they get locked in this embassy for seven years? Like, what is their crime exactly in comparison to the crimes that he's revealed? Yes. Like, that's where it's crazy. The, 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 when you look at the the balance, the imbalance between what his crime is and the crimes that he's revealed. I mean, he's revealed some staggering crimes and no one's concentrating on that. The government is not freaking out. We've got to, we've got some, obviously uh, we have work to do. We have corrections to make. There's none of that talk. There's get that guy talk. Yeah, that's right. And uh, you know, like uh, it's sort of uh, under the veil of patriotism, a lot can be concealed. And, and that is a, a, an incident that, passes through several administrations yes. so like you he's been you, there for seven years so like, yeah so it makes you think well what is the, the what are the differences you know like i kind of you know sort of uh, i been on bill maher's show i like bill maher i'm up, i'm you know very sympathetic to left you know i'm ultimately beyond left left wing i'm you know trying to my belief is that we should try and organize a system based on hallucinogenic experience for fuck's sake there's there's no party for me and i'm not even allowed the fucking hallucinogens so like uh, you know so like i'm like you know i'm not a right-wing person it's safe to say but like i feel that so many of the problems that we're experiencing now is because the the democratic left-wing liberal organizations stopped serving the people they were in the case of the british labor party designed or set up to serve they neglected them they abandoned them you know the white or the white world working class in Britain were 50, 60 years ago told, hey, there's this thing called Britain. We want you to go out there and fight and die for it. Give up your sons. Get out there. Oh, and now they're told, hey, there's no such thing as uh, Britain. And like, yeah, they, so, no wonder people are confused. No mm. wonder people are baffled. No wonder there are abandoned constituencies and despair and rage. And I, I feel that in a way, 
it's like what is patriotism resourced from a sense that we all need to belong that we want to be together that you know that we're willing to believe in a fictional idea a flag and a story about you know the origin of a nation whether that's an old one like mine or a new one like this one you know we're willing to participate in that but if those values aren't real if they aren't like if it is we are going to support the most powerful we will lie to you whenever necessary when our lies are revealed we'll imprison punish and lie about those people People. we don't care about the most vulnerable what the fuck is the flag that we're waving who is it for it's a good point and on that note let's wrap this bitch up good we went out high we went that was a good one it was a good way to end it russell you're awesome man oh, i love thanks, you Joe. always I love appreciate you, you always like being around you yeah me and too. uh your book mentors it's out now your Bless podcast you. will be available uh on luminary starting 23rd 23rd of this month, so just a few days. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the show. Bye-bye.